People's number one argument that don't like Trump is always about his ego. If you're genuinely saying that I won't vote for anyone who doesn't have an ego, then you should just rescind your voting registration like me and Aaron and stop talking <laughs> because you're only ever gonna have options from ego versus ego. You can't be in politics. You can't survive in that system if you're not strongly identified with your eye construct and you're wearing masks. Kamala has an ego too. The strategy is just different. It's more elusive. It's the snake in the grass that will bite you when you turn your back to it. So my thoughts are just like whatever way you look at it strategy wise, this is very positive for America. I think we need to look past the person and their imperfections. The ego, when it disagrees with somebody, it doesn't want to see the true reality of the person. It wants to turn them into the furthest, most extreme version of them it can create. And every single video or picture I see of a like a radical left person like screaming at the camera with tears in their face and stuff. It just makes me feel sad for them and deep compassion. I don't wanna see somebody hurt like that. We need unity so bad. We've got to get over this division of I'm right, you're wrong. Anyone I know who's tapped in spiritually was saying this as well, which is that this is really just an election between truth and delusion. And people are only seeming to vote for Trump or Kamala, but it's like you're really making a choice of are you still swayed by illusions or are you committed to truth? What's going on, family? Welcome back to the Great Awakening Show. We have a very special episode for you today. Today, we're going to be going into the post-election madness, some reflections, some, I guess you could call it coverage, but really we're going to be going into all that has transpired since we last filmed. And I know a lot of you are super eager to hear our thoughts and some updates. And obviously the news cycle the last two weeks has been insane, Aaron. So me and Aaron were just talking before we started filming and uh, we were joking around about how we kind of both feel like since day one of deciding to start this show, we've been like waiting for this, uh, this kind of moment and it's a little bit cathartic. How are you feeling about it, Aaron? Yeah, dude. Yeah, it's, it's very surreal. Uh, I, I said this to a number of my friends. I was texting like Kyle Cease and Andre Dacum and some other people being like, hey, do you just feel like we just shifted timelines or something in the craziest way ever? Like it felt just like this very palpable energetic shift in the collective consciousness on election night that I've never experienced before. Um, and it makes sense when you think about it because we essentially went from the lowest of the lows to the highest of the highs. Mm -hmm. You know, the majority of the country, probably 70% or something, we're feeling that way. Um, we went through four years of the most hellacious administration we've ever seen. The most crime, the most war, the most you name it. And then we go back to the anti-war president, the anti-deep state, anti-fake news. You know, it's an incredibly huge polarizing shift we just made. So it makes sense why we all felt that. But I think we all were feeling the implications very much like the Elon podcast on Rogan the night of the election where Elon was like, hey, if we don't win, this is the last chance for democracy. I think a lot of us were kind of feeling that based on the all the things that have transpired right in the last four years, the sens censorship industrial complex, you I know, like that. really taking over social media, the, the weaponization of the justice system endless proxy wars, open borders, inflation, money printing. We just, it was absolute chaos in our country the last four years. And so it felt like we shifted from a potentially very dark timeline if the deep state had been given another four years to control the government. I think we all would have been saying, okay, buckle up. Things might get even more rough than the last four years. So that was something that I was totally mentally prepared for. Like, hey, I know that whatever happens is God's will. So if Kamala had won, I would have said, all right, thy will be done, God. What, what do you got in store for us? But um, after the last four years, I wouldn't, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't uh, nice to see that it went the other direction. Yes. Just because you need, we need to have ebbs and flows, right? That's yep. the nature of the universe is vibration. So you don't want to be down in the darkness of the shadow for too long. You got to go down there for sure and do some healing and excavation, but then you want to go back up to the light and remember what it's all about and enjoy the light. And that gives you strength to go back into the darkness. 
So I just felt like eight years of straight nonstop deep state corruption would have been too much for most Americans to handle. And we probably would have seen a civil war type experience in our country or it would, things would have probably gotten a lot worse and more polarized than they are. So I was very happy to see that God's will is that we shift timelines a bit now and we've experienced the corruption for four years. Let's experience, hopefully, and we'll see, but let's experience some healing and some balancing of our government, some accountability for corruption. Let's do some government reform. These are all the things that the Trump and his team have been talking about, RFK, Tulsi Gabbard, on and on and on. And so I think that's shaping up to be what we're going to get. And so I'm just very grateful and excited for what God is doing on our planet and our, in our country, especially in that we are actually on the precipice. I mean, like sometimes we miss the forest for the trees, right? Let's all take a step back and appreciate where we are in history right now, where uh, we're at a place that I, I certainly didn't think I would see some of these things in my lifetime, such as, you know, Trump was asked point blank. I think it was on Rogan, maybe a few other podcasts. Uh, you know, would you get rid of federal income tax? And Trump said, yes, I want to replace yeah. federal income tax with tariffs. And he explained this is how we used to do it in the late 1800s. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I never thought I would ever hear a politician say we should do away with federal income tax in my lifetime. I would have bet money that that was going to be 50, 100 years from now. We might start hearing that stuff. And then, you know, other things as well that I just didn't think I would expect to see in our lifetime, like both sides of the aisle reaching over and extending each other the olive branch and saying, look, you're on the left. I've been on the right. Who really cares? Both sides have become so corrupt by the Washington machine. Let's just join forces and accomplish our shared goal, which is to heal this country and the corruption and the disease epidemic. Right. And we've seen people on both sides of the political aisle unite for a common goal. I really didn't know if I would see something like that in my lifetime, at least not to the strength and, you know, intensity we've seen it with, you know, RFK and Elon and Tulsi and Tucker Carlson, Vivek Ramaswamy and all these people joining Trump. It's like, wow, what an amazing change to American politics. And we'll get into this more as we go into the show. But something I really want to talk about is the incredible ways that Trump has kind of changed the entire landscape of the way that presidential elections will be run in the future, you know, campaigning for president, mainstream media, so many things that like desperately needed. Yep. We've needed these reforms so badly in these systems. And Trump basically just ended mainstream media. <laughs> he basically just ended the old model of, of running for president of, you know, uh, f sloppy food fight debates where you get a 30, 60 second soundbite and then a moderator cuts you off and your opponent cuts you off and starts insulting you and then back and forth. It's like, you don't get to know anyone this way. You don't get to discuss or learn about policy this way. It's It's been this very uh, carefully designed scheme to fool the American public into the illusion of a real election. When, as we say, both candidates have historically always been controlled by the same people. And so now that that era is over, thanks to Trump, you've got to go on podcast circuits. You've got to do lots and lots of long form discussions so people can get to know you and not just hear you hide behind a teleprompter and 30 second sound bites on ABC News. That's not good enough to win elections anymore. And if nothing else good comes out of this <laughs> election cycle, I think we should all agree that that would be one massive positive. For sure. Yeah, you just dropped a lot of bombs there. I think... Uh... This is totally unplanned, but I, I think it would be cool to segue into a little bit of um, election strategy and some just some things that stood out. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, but there's a few things I want to speak to because go for one it. One reason why uh, politics is uh, interesting to me is because it's like it's a game of strategy. It's just like uh, chess or anything else. Right. And yeah. we've talked, you know, on and off about the strategy. Um People sometimes think that we're endorsing a certain side when we talk about that, but I'm just interested in looking at it from a from a strategy perspective. So, some interesting things that that stood out to me. Um, this was obviously the first election, as you just touched on, where we had any sort of presidential candidate going on podcasts, and that alone is like fourth turning as fuck. 
Yeah, for <laughs> but sure. But not just any podcast. You know, we had Trump going on Twit, one of the biggest Twitch streamers in the world, Aiden Ross. I don't know if you know who that is. He he gifted yeah. Trump a cyber truck wrapped, a I wrapped cyber truck with like Trump on it. He has like millions and millions of massive audience. He went on, he was going on like the Nelk Boys. I don't know if you know who mm-hmm. that is. Yep. Um, he did Theo Vaughn. He did Rogan. Schultz. I mean, he was doing Rogan heavy hitter after heavy hitter, right? PBD. Oh yeah, he did do PBD. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so that's obviously like Trump's strategy. Right. And it's fairly interesting to hear him talk about how, um, Baron was like the mastermind behind it, supposedly like telling him dad yeah. that this is a big dude, like go on him, like makes don't go sense, on him. which is cool. Right. Cause he's more of a, he's younger than us. He's in his, in his young twenties. So, so we had like, we had Trump go on, uh, Elon or sorry, we had Trump go on Rogan. We had JD Vance go on Rogan. We had Elon go on Rogan within like a week. I think it was like, like a few days. It, yeah. Like, like four days. I think it was like back to back. It was like back. Trump, JD Vance, Elon. Right. And so that's like that, that's like their strategy. Right. And then on the other side, you have Kamala doing the strategy of let's spend a shitload of money. I don't know if you saw those stats on what their campaign spent, but Crazy. let's spend a shitload of money on the biggest entertainers and influencers in the world. Let's get the Beyonce's, the Cardi B's, Oh, who else was there? There was so many different. Lady Gaga. There was so many different like Eminem, like people you're just like, oh, come on, bro. (laughs) They got the call. as Yeah, yeah. And it's just like every single one has ties to Diddy, right? I don't know if you've seen that, but it's like, it's just this giant blackmail list and every single one of them went up there and it was hilarious because with the Beyonce thing, they, um, I guess they promised people a concert. So a shitload of people came for Beyonce and then she just did a two minute speech and people were booing like really loud. Yeah. And then Cardi B, they brought up Cardi B and her teleprompter went out. That did was you see crazy that? to watch. <laughs> so it's like, it's, you know, it comes back to how we talk about like the simulation and this is just like a very interesting experience to go through as as a collective and on the one hand you have this like old model of like Mm -hmm. you're basically an actor right this old model Mm -hmm. of like fool people and and use like centralized media and do it the way it's always been done and then you have this other approach of like podcasts and just like off the cuff and doing things in a completely different way and you know what's interesting about that is that the the conservatives and uh, AKA Republicans they they are supposed to stand for upholding tradition and not wanting to change. I know, isn't that and interesting? And Democrats are supposed to be all about reform the and innovation and progression. Mm-hmm. And yet, when it comes to this approach, the strategy, they're taking a really outdated like old approach. Like, there's not mm-hmm. innovation. It's not a progressive approach. <laughs> And then, right. and then the Republicans are like, yo, hold my drink. Or maybe because it's more of just Trump, right? And an interesting yeah, thing. Yeah, it's really I'm, not the Republicans. Yeah, it's not the Republicans. While I'm saying this, uh, just came to me. Trump used to be Demo- a Democrat. New York Democrat so his entire like, life. He just is like, yo, we're going to take this strategy and like fly in the face of what Republicans probably would normally do. And fly in the face of what Democrats are going to normally do. And I think we saw that pan out. And, I, and the reason that I bring that up is because, and I want to get your take on this, but... Joe Rogan endorsed Trump and stepped into the political spotlight for the first time in his life, at least the first time in his public life since starting the podcast and everything. He was a staunch Democrat before. before. He was very against it. People would try to red pill him on Trump or have him on. I'm not giving him a platform. I'm not giving him a spotlight. I'm not getting involved in this. And it's very interesting to see that shift over the years. Yeah. My thoughts in, in this moment are that without Elon and Rogan, Elon buying Twitter, how would, how would millions of people have had access to this information? Without that and without Rogan, Trump, didn't, I don't think, stood a chance at winning this election. What are your thoughts? I probably agree with that. Um, it was RFK who first began saying, I mean, to your point, Trump, lifelong New York Democrat, RFK, the darling of the Democrats yep. since the 1960s. Um, Tulsi. Elon Musk, Democrat, Tulsi, Democrat, Brett Weinstein, Democrat. It's really more of a Democrat movement than it is Republican. Yeah, his whole squad is Democrat. They like just... 80%. I think I think Tucker's been a lifelong conservative. I could yeah. be wrong. I don't know. I don't and I don't even know if Tucker's going to like play a role in his cabinet, but 
he's kind of been joining forces with the the new Justice League, as they're calling it. Yeah. Um, Vivek, I think, is a lifelong conservative. So outside of them and J.D. Vance, maybe, everyone else has been Democrat. So I love the unity that that is showing that we're we as a collective are finally getting past our labels and political affiliations. And it's like, well, I always wear red. You always wear blue. So we can't join forces or be team, a teammate on something. It's so childish. It's so immature. And it's so great to see people finally maturing past that saying, look, you may be this, I may be that. But at the end of the day, we agree on 90% of the same things. We all want a good, safe world for each other and our children. We don't want war. We don't want death and disease. And so why, why can't we unite on the things we agree on as strongly as we fight about the things we disagree on? That's a great <clears throat> adaptation to see in the collective. And before I won't play any clips yet, but I have some on this topic, but I'll, I'll give you my feelings on this whole thing, really as it pertains to Trump as a, as a figurehead. Um, I'm always interested in looking at what is the universe doing through anything, through this person, through that person, through this movement, through that movement. Everything is the will of God unfolding. And so I'm always very interested in how is God wanting to use this person for a certain purpose? And I've always looked at Trump like that because he's obviously the most polarizing figure we've ever seen in our in our life. So as for me, like I've always been really put off by the disturbingly fake, inauthentic tactics of politicians, like most people, right? But my entire adult life, I've just not been able to stomach watching any mainstream news or listening to political speeches. To me, it's always just been unwatchable. You know, it's so obnoxiously fake and scripted. <laughs> uh, the tactics, the behaviors of politicians are, are cringeworthy if you have self-awareness, right? They're so obviously inauthentic and there's always a hidden agenda. You can feel it like an, uh, you know, cutting a knife through butter or whatever. You can feel it in the room when they talk. There's an ulterior motive behind this person's words. It almost feels like an insult to your intelligence to watch political speeches yep. in our country and, and be, like as if you would take this person seriously. Like this is who they really are and these are their own unique ideas from their own mind. It's like we understand everyone's controlled by handlers and a deep state team of, you know, central bankers and whatnot. Like this is just, we've all gotten numb to it at this point. And then what we learned in 2016 is that most of America apparently feels the same way because Trump, you know, campaigns against Hillary and nobody gave him a shot. Not even Trump himself thought he could win at first because he wasn't part said of the, it was a blowout. What's that? The polls said it was a blowout. Hillary, For Hillary. was going to blow him out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And nobody gave him a real shot because he wasn't part of the political machine in Washington. And so there's just no way he could beat one of them, we thought. You know, they control the media, they control the DOJ, they control the intelligence agencies, they control Washington. How are you going to beat them? And yet, that's exactly what Trump somehow did. And it's because the collective consciousness was ripe for a person like Trump. If Trump had appeared in the 1980s, I don't think he would have stood a chance at winning because people weren't burnt out enough yet with the fakeness and inauthenticity of media and, and po uh, politics in our country. So. The universe manifested Donald Trump at the perfect time. And in fact, did you see the speech RFK gave at um, the, the, the last big convention they did? Like a couple days before the election, maybe three or four days. You want to say a line or two or what was the, the RFK topic? just gave this amazing speech. It was kind of funny because he was giving a speech and he was like, I'm being told that Trump is not yet in the building and so I'm being asked to stall. And like the 80,000 people just start laughing. <laughs> but RFK was given this amazing speech, dude. Yeah, I was getting goosebumps listening to it. He was like, when I was a, when I was a child, only one in 10,000 kids had a case of autism. It was so rare that most practitioners had never even seen it in somebody and wouldn't have known what to call it when they saw it. It was very rare a kid would be autistic. Today, it's one in eight kids are autistic, something like that. He said, when I was a kid, a doctor would have never seen, probably never seen a diabetic child in their entire life practice. And now it's one in 10 children are diabetic. And he goes on and on and on. He's like, what's happened to our country? We're poisoning ourselves. We're poisoning our children. We're killing our children. And we can't even wake up and agree on the fact that it's happening. Like we need systemic change fast or we're going to lose this generation of kids. And everybody was just like, it was the most incredible wow. speech 
to see between a speaker and the audience because they would just like thunderously roar in approval of what he was saying. And then the coolest part was uh, RFK said, every morning I wake up and pray for 30 minutes a day that God, and he gets interrupted by this thunderous applause. The crowd goes bananas and starts cheering and clapping so much so that he kind of takes a step back from the mic and just lets the audience go. Damn. And it was like, it was like a whole minute of cheering for that statement. And he didn't even finish the sentence yet. And so when the clapping dies down, he goes, and I pray that God would give me a chance to end the disease epidemic in America. I pray that every day of my life for the last, you know, five years or something. And God sent me Donald Trump. And then oh the place just God. goes wild, bro. And I just got goosebumps because it's like something truly profound is happening in this movement that God is using, yes, very imperfect people as God does all throughout the Old Testament. God about to say that. loves using imperfect people. <laughs> So we should get used to that and accept that. Yeah. But it's like, what a time to be alive. You know, we just watched Trump in 2016 do the impossible, like something out of a movie. He sort of goes on stage and, you know, talks from his own original thoughts, shoots from the hip, doesn't read from a teleprompter and says some pretty politically incorrect things. And people are like, hey, I kind of like this guy. He's giving it to him, right? Finally, somebody who's at least being real up there. And so Trump starts to gain this huge following. And then the media goes on its usual smear campaign, pulling out all the usual accusations about stuff from Trump's past, verbal gaffes from 10 years ago, twisting his words to make him sound racist, all in this attempt to try to tarnish his reputation with the public so he won't get elected. But people didn't buy it. And so like some kind of miracle, Donald Trump, despite the media storm against him, defeats the darling of Washington, D.C., Hillary Clinton, and becomes the president. Nobody thought that could happen. And like, personally, Jeremy, I kind of like a good underdog story, don't you? Yeah, I think the people do as well. A hundred percent. I mean, everyone likes seeing progress, even if it comes in an uncomfortable way. And, you know, Donald Trump's an uncomfortable character because he's so authentically who he is and he doesn't hide his ego and he shoots from the hip and he calls people losers and stuff. So like... <laughs> He's rough around the edges, right? So people are really quick to judge. But progress is always a good thing, no matter what the catalyst for it is. And so my feelings have always been, I don't care about somebody's past. Oh my goodness. I don't judge people by who they were in the past. That's an extremely arrogant and narcissistic thing to do. We have all done bad things in our past. We've Facts. all made mistakes. Why would we want to create a world where we all judge one another by our pasts? I don't want to live in a world like that, and I'm sure nobody listening does. So if we don't, then we shouldn't create that world by holding other people to their past, right? If, if you don't want to be judged by your past failures, of which there are many, then you shouldn't judge other people for theirs. You should let people be a new creation in the present moment. Maybe they've learned from their mistakes. You don't know. This is the golden rule, right? That Jesus taught. Whatever you would not wish to suffer yourself, do not do to someone else, but treat others as you wish to be treated. But I digress because I'm probably unique to most people in this perspective because I'm a spiritual teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm grateful for all of the horrible, embarrassing mistakes I've made in the past because they all taught me invaluable lessons and made me into such a better person. And so in my mind, it's very good if somebody has made big mistakes in the past. I like that, so long as they've learned from them and used them to become a better person. And so that's what you have to look for, not have they made mistakes. I mean, that's ridiculous. Everybody's made mistakes. You just don't know about Obama's skeletons in the closet or Biden or Kamala's skeletons in the closet because they work for the machine that censors that stuff from you knowing about it. They only let you know the skeletons they want you to see, right? That's how they keep the illusion going. And so, you know, back in 2016, I remember being at, I worked at Google at the time as a personal trainer and every single one of my clients is, um, you know, very much on the left. And I was also, I would have told you I was a liberal in those days, but they start talking about this Trump guy, Donald Trump, which I knew about Trump, but not much. I knew he was a famous billionaire and stuff, but that all my clients start talking about how evil Trump is and he's Hitler and he's this and he's that. And my first thought was like, why are we just now finding out that this guy is the most evil human who's ever lived? 
Didn't, didn't he have the number one TV show for like 10 years, The Apprentice? Like we know who this guy, he's been on Oprah a bunch of times. He's on all the talk shows. Like if he was this evil Nazi fascist, I'm sure we would have seen the signs of it by now. But Trump is loved everywhere he go. Like nobody has said this about Trump until he ran for president. So I was a little suspicious. And then day after day, my clients are just repeating talking points I'm hearing on the CNN TVs. And I started to pick up like this echo chamber I was in where like CNN says something about Trump. You know, Trump said very fine people. What a horrible thing. And then my client shows up at two o'clock and they're like, did you hear that Trump said very fine people on both sides? And I'm like, yeah, I watched it on CNN an hour ago like you did. And now we're all <laughs> blithering about it. You know, it's just so obvious that this was an echo chamber. And I'm like, something funky's going on here. And so like, do I really, do, does anyone think that I care about someone's past? Yes, they do. But the media is mistaken about that because the vast majority of the country just showed we don't care about people's pasts. We're not under the delusion that there's some perfect person out there who we can elect for president. I mean, that's, that's a pipe dream of delusional proportions, right? We don't want a perfect person. We want a real person. Yeah. We want somebody not controlled. Uh, we don't want a controlled puppet anymore. We need someone who has a genuinely good intention for America that isn't working for a deep state corporate faction of, you know, elites. We need someone who actually cares about America and has the skill set required to perform the job. And the American people saw that Trump checked both of those boxes in a big way. So as long as a leader has these intentions, like any leader, right? This is an aspect of the law of one. If you have a genuine intention to be of service to others and to help heal and cause good in the world, good to others, then you gain the protection of the light under the law of one, such that the law of one will be of assistance to you and protection to you so that you can accomplish that service you desire. This is something Ra talks about in the law of one. And I think we would all say we've seen that protection <laughs> and we've seen that assistance over Trump which, I mean, if you can't pick this up just by listening to him talk, which to me, it's very obvious when I hear Trump talk. He's got a big ego, rough around the edges, but he really cares about people and he really cares about the country and wants to make America great. And there's no denying that, in my opinion. So like when you, when you feel that authenticity, then you have to look at the evidence to support it, which is, you know, Trump surviving an assassination attempt on live TV. We've never seen that before. And immediately getting back up at 80 years old. Yeah, 78 years old, I mean, to what? handle it like that. I mean, Aaron, I think clearly... he has more testosterone than most 20 to 30-year-olds right now in our generation. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, there's an epidemic of that, right? Super low testosterone. If you just look at his behavior and his yes. temperament. Yeah, it's like it's gone out of style to be like a strong, masculine man. Yeah, it's considered With courage and determination. And yeah, it's, it's considered toxic, which... You know, that's another uh, smart strategy by the deep state. But, yeah. you know, we should ask ourselves, what good is God wanting to accomplish through this administration? Because it's very clear it's God's will, right? Love that question. Whatever, ha whatever happens in reality is God's will. And, you know, watching Trump survive getting shot in the head through his ear and coming that close to dying on national TV, how can you not say, okay, wow, this guy's got some karmic favor on his side? So, I mean... Everything is God's will, right? Even the Biden administration. This is what I, I was talking to myself through in 2020 when the Biden-Harris won the election was that the deep state, unfortunately, is coming back into power in Washington. But that's going to be of some kind of good outcome. I can't see it right now, but God knows and God's doing something probably to wake people up. But it's like this election just revealed to us what the last four years was for, right? It was to completely burn the American people out on mainstream media and corrupt leadership in our government and collusion and proxy wars and woke ideology and censorship. Oh my gosh, the American people are just done with yep. it all. And so we elected a guy who didn't start any new wars, who didn't collude with Washington bureaucrats, who didn't open our borders, you know, who didn't print $12 trillion dollars. And America said, we want that guy back. And I actually brought these two graphics to show this. To me, these graphics show this incredible shift in the collective consciousness. I'll share this one first. What's going on, guys? We want to take a really quick break from the show to let you know that if you appreciate and support 
what we're doing with this show and what we're doing with the Great Awakening mission, please consider subscribing to our Rumble channel as YouTube has now deleted two full episodes of ours without warning or explanation. And we're not sure how much longer our content will be allowed on YouTube. And we want to ensure that this content stays on the internet. And this is why we've moved our whole channel now over to Rumble, which you can find the link for that in the description below. With that being said, let's get back to the show. Did you see this graph? Yeah, bro. Uh, I think it was Theo Vaughn, or so I saw some comedian make a joke that that looks like the FUE hair transplant. Yeah. <laughs> like where totally they do all does. the dots on your head. For those looking at this chart, uh, these red arrows means that that you know, town or demographic area shifted that far to the right. The longer the arrow is, the more to the right they shifted. So like Southern Texas, this is where the boy, look at this, man. And look this at is where Florida the border too. crisis was really happening. These are the people that were really suffering from the, you know, 10, 20 million illegals entering our country. Mm -hmm. um, I think over 12 identifiable drug cartels, different drug cartels. Wow. Um, infiltrating our country in this area. Um, Homeland Security has said. So these people have been suffering greatly. Look at this massive candle to the right. Yeah. And then look at Florida and North Carolina, everywhere. And the blue arrows represent areas that went left. I'm not sure exactly where that is. Maybe that's near Ad Atlanta, maybe. But, you know, very comparatively few blue candles to the versus red candles. So this was the collective shift in consciousness right here on this graph. It's kind of cool to look at it from that perspective. This is how many people said, and by the way, this this is less filled in over on the left because this graph was taken during the election night before the West Coast and Mountain mm. Time states had reported in yet. So you can get the full one and it's pretty much the same thing everywhere, just the entire map shifting to the right. We've never quite seen a shift in the collective this dramatic. Not I during think that our that, lifetime, at least. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that, man? Well, shit. You just said a lot. There's a few things I noted down that I wanted to definitely touch on because um, it got my got my gears turning. So <laughs> you were talking about this notion of like what it brought what it brought to my mind is you were describing the old model. You didn't call it that, but this is kind of yeah, what I want to speak to. The old model. So many like people's number one argument for uh, that don't like Trump is always about his. Uh, his ego and in, in some way his imperfections, right? They'll either yeah. bring up something he's supposedly done, something he supposedly is, or something he's supposedly currently doing. Uh, all of it is around like what you said, like mistakes he's either made in the past or things that mm -hmm. are even debatable whether or not he did or is doing, but ways in which he's perceived. And it's so interesting because like you bring up a great point, at least during our lifetime, this is the first president where when they're running for the election, like their um, what is focused on is their uh, imperfections. Whereas typically mm -hmm. the model is like, okay, you have two talking heads and they both act like they're perfect embodied role models that are yeah. like this, the something people want to aspire for. The and epitome they, and of so they virtue. can't admit like any wrong and, and the machine that they stand on top of helps them in covering everything possible up. And the only time when it gets leaked, like for example, a Monica Lewinsky type situation or a, or a George Bush type situation or something, they have to like really push it with like a scandal or something yeah. for their imperfections to even be acknowledged. Yeah. Whereas with Trump, it's the exact opposite, right? It's like, let's go like two decades back. Let's find everything and let's like focus on that constantly. And I just find it interesting because it is a good point. Like, I mean, most of our, I mean, our audience is going to be aware of this. Me and you are aware of this. I mean, there's a lot of dark shit going on behind the scenes, uh, whether we're talking about things going on with children or things that go on in Hollywood or things that are going on um, inside the government or against our own citizens or w whatever, right? None of that is is ever even like pursued or spoken to in regards yeah. to like one side of the political aisle. But when like someone who doesn't come from that tries to run, like 
all of the imperfections get focused on, which is very mm-hmm. interesting, right? Because I mean, yeah, even like 2016 that you kept referencing, I mean, Hillary has some of the clearest ties to children and Epstein Island out of any politician period. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's just one small example. So that's one thought that I had when you're describing, it's kind of like this, the old model that we're always talking about, like on this show, the great awakening, right? The evolution of consciousness in real time, the old model seems to be kind of crumbling because why, why do they use the old model? Why are they still doing it? Why are they still acting like Kamala is the one coming up with what she's saying when she's wearing this obvious little (laughs) recorder on Mm -hmm. her ear? Yeah. Because they think that that like, they think that that still works. And then you have someone come in and go against all of those rules and win. I do think this is a lot bigger than, than Trump. I think people just got a blueprint for how politics can and hopefully will be approached in the future where I think people were baffled. I mean, Aaron, did you, I had a blast on election night. I watched only the uh, liberal channels to see how the commentators oh. talked about it. And not only did they put the, the, they didn't show the accurate score, mm-hmm. uh, the accurate number of votes throughout the night. It would be behind like Fox news, what they were showing, for example, mm-hmm. but the way that they would talk about it, they were so shocked and baffled <laughs> on live. Like they were genuinely like they, they had, some of them had tears. They were just like, I, I don't understand how the American people could vote. For, and it's like, you don't want to understand. Exactly. There's an aspect where it's like, America is screaming at you guys. Get off your high horse and yeah. listen. Like, yep. it was almost a, a, this is an insane red wave, right? That's what they call mm-hmm. it. It wasn't just the president. It was the House. It was the Senate. I mean, it was, it was cool. And neither of us even voted. Mm-hmm. Nor would I ever call myself a Republican. It's just, it's not about that. It's about like there was an there was an ideological movement and now yeah. people have to listen. They have to listen. Like America just voted for this guy that you guys were trying to write off as an anti-vaxxer and he's going to step in and reform the entire I don't know if you want to call it the I guess the food and and drug system or yeah. well, however you want to think of it, right? And there there's a lot of these different examples where America also voted to downsize the government People really liked when they talked about Elon coming in as the Doge Department of Government Efficiency, I think, to downsize. Mm -hmm. So cool. I mean, there's just a lot of those things. So that's one thing I wanted to uh, touch on. And then the other thing is uh, in regards to Trump having an ego, my thoughts here are you were speaking to how people get caught up on him, like his imperfections and him having an ego and just shooting from the hip and all that. But you said something along the lines of like, but he genuinely does care and he wants the best for, for the country. Mm -hmm. And for one thing I've noticed is like people seem to really get hung up on the fact that he can act egoically. And they, they seem to like correlate that with meaning. So he won't do what's in our best interest. And I just want to remind everyone here that if you're playing a a game at that level called (laughs) running for the presidency, it is the highest level ego game you could possibly play. Yeah. And let me just spell out the stakes for you. If your ego will not get validation or what it wants in terms of its self image or reinforced identity, it will not be able to feel good about itself if it doesn't do what it says it's going to do. And so Trump is running on a whole list of things he says he's going to do. The very first one was that he said he was going to win check ego validation. (laughs) Right. But now there's a long list, right? Uh, Deport illegals and make changes to taxes, make changes to Mm -hmm. tariffs and pharma and blah, blah, blah. Lots of stuff. So many different things, right? Which we can talk about in a bit, but I just want to remind people, if you're genuinely saying that I won't vote for anyone who doesn't have an ego, 
then you should just rescind your voting registration like me and Aaron and stop talking <laughs> because you're only ever going to have options from ego versus ego. That's extremely flawed. They're literally like you can't be in politics. You can't survive in that system if you're not strongly identified with your eye construct and you're wearing yeah. masks. That's like yes. what that's what that is. We, we couldn't mm -hmm. have politics if we were all just our capital S self. Right. Like mm -hmm. that, that model doesn't, it's a 3D we wouldn't need model. politics if we were all perfect. Right. So it's, it's just an interesting thing where it's like, it seems like what people are saying is, oh, well, I can't vote for someone who has an ego. And it's like, Kamala has an ego too. The strategy is just different. It's more elusive. It's the snake in the grass that will bite you when you turn your back to it. Whereas uh -huh. Trump is just like this loud, brash New Yorker. Who's like, if you don't like me, fuck you. And it's like, <laughs> but he actually seems to care. And even if you don't believe that he seems to care and he totally doesn't care and behind the scenes, he shit talks all of us. And he's like, I hate the American people. You can rest good at night knowing that his ego is so giant, according to most people. He won't allow himself to fail because his ego will take a massive hit if he doesn't do what he says he's going to do. So my thoughts right. are just like, whatever way you look at it, strategy wise, this is very positive for America. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to look past the person and their imperfections. A hundred percent, man. Well said. And what I'll add to that is it's, it's just really, it's kind of ignorant to think that we can or should have a perfect person running for president at this point, or like. Even people in the truther movement are um, will have this opinion, which I uh, totally agree with. They'll be like, "Well, Trump is is just so you know he's imperfect. He's not he's not the perfect candidate. Trump's not the ideal candidate we want. We want a more libertarian candidate or whatever." And it's like, yes, of course, Trump isn't the ideal <laughs> candidate. We don't deserve the ideal candidate. We're not going to get the ideal candidate. You don't go from a hundred years of deep state controlled puppets to suddenly having the perfect ideal candidate. You get what you get. You get what the collective <laughs> karma determines you get. And so of course we're gonna get a person that kind of reflects the collective consciousness of humanity right now, which is that most people are completely lost and identified with their ego. And so of course he's polarizing figure because if you if it's in you, it's going to trigger you and somebody else. And that's what Trump does is he triggers people's egos. I mean, even the comment you said about, um, I can't remember exactly what it was now, but something like, I don't want to vote for somebody with an ego, yeah, with a big ego. Much. It's like spoken like a very unintegrated ego. <laughs> you know, you're, you're not aware of how reality works. Clearly, there's no ideal candidate coming to run for president. No. Instead, evolution progresses slowly, step by step. And all we should be concerned with, if we're interested in the collective consciousness evolving and the highest good of our planet, we should only be concerned with identifying what is a genuine step in the right direction. Is it a step in the right direction? And for me, for all of Trump's flaws and imperfections, he represents clearly a step in the right direction in the way that he's disrupting the establishment, the mainstream media, totally changing the old model of things and like we've said, the old model is now obsolete thanks to Trump and the way he ran this this candidacy. So it's like, why do we think we deserve the perfect candidate when we're so polarized and hateful and divisive and judgmental? We don't. And so we should just be aware of what we are getting and how God is using Trump in this moment, right? Because it's just one step to the next. I don't think we've entered some utopia or whatever, but you and I were texting on election night and with this it's, it's more due to the way that Trump won than the fact that Trump won. Exactly. It's because of the massive landslide, yes. right? That we were texting each other and I was like, do you think this represents the end of the fourth turning? And have we just now officially sort of stepped into the next first turning? I don't know. We, we can't know right now. We can only speculate. But I wouldn't be surprised if we look back in five or 10 years and go, that's when we shifted. Yeah. Yeah, I totally forgot about that. We were we were debatably going to get into that on the show. I think One I think speculate. it's too early to tell. It For it sure. will really depend on what it's going to really depend on the things that he does, you know, in the next 4 years or doesn't do. So Yeah. It we go, will see. It could go one of two ways. Yeah. Either Trump does all of these government reforms. I mean, dude, Trump is clearly clearly he means business cuz he's dropped like 4 or 5 
I mean, you know, the three type, minute long videos, the type What's of that? things, let me just quickly go through what you're referencing. The yeah, type of things to... that he's proposing just quick. This isn't nearly all of them, but no tax on tips, no tax on social security, no tax on overtime, potentially no tax for active military veterans and police, potentially getting rid of the IRS, firing Woo! SEC chair, Gary Gensler, firing head of the uh, head of the Fed, uh, Jerome Powell. Unbelievable. He's very pro crypto and has launched his own crypto coin. Talks about the future of blockchain and how it's going to be yep. in America first. Said he wants to adopt Bitcoin. Wants to lower corporate income tax to 15% from 21%. Uh, wants to roll back Biden's income tax hikes on the wealthiest Americans. Wants to remove the Inflation Reduction Act um, that finance energy measures intended to combat climate change. He wants to do the whole tariff thing, which I think everyone is well aware of 10 to 20% on foreign goods. He wants to reinstitute executive order requiring the FDA that the FDA buy essential medications only from U S companies. So everything is like his whole thing is bringing it back to U S right? Like if yeah. American companies want to build in other um, countries, they're going to be like seriously penalized. And then yeah. also foreign uh, businesses, like especially China, Japan, yeah. et cetera. Taiwan, they're going to be required to build here, and that's going to obviously create jobs and et cetera, et cetera, and yep. help offset the taxes and all that. Um, block Amazing purchases decisions. of any vital uh, infrastructure in the U.S. by Chinese. I mean, there's been so many different things, right? But I think the the biggest like bombshells are him talking about the IRS, him talking about not liking the Federal Reserve, <laughs> and. Um, some of the stuff with taxes and, and tariffs and all of that. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, you were in the middle of a point. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I wanted to kind of riff, run through those for the, for the audience. Yeah, actually, I'm going to share my screen so we can. The, my favorite one so far has been, well, I really appreciated a lot of what he said in the bringing the Bible back to America. Oh, yeah. Obviously, that was you guys great... know I love the Bible. Yeah. Um, I have some very nuanced takes on it, but I love the Bible. Um, but this, this one was his plan, his 10 step plan to dismantle the deep state. I was like, am I living in a simulation? How is this happening? I know. I, know. <laughs> I never thought I would hear a politician say such a thing. Check this out. And I have the video too, but we'll just read these. Trump says one, I will immediately reissue my 2020 executive order, restoring the president's authority to remove rogue bureaucrats. That's super important. Clean out all the corrupt actors in our national security and intelligence apparatus. I think um, RFK is going to have a lot to do with that yep. since he's going to give RFK the... Uh, is he making a new commission for RFK to investigate, I think, presidential yeah. assassinations? Yep. And he's the head of it. Yeah. So he can go deep into the CIA corruption and stuff. Yeah. So that's huge. His dad, his uncle. <laughs> yep. Expose the hoaxes and abuses of power that have been tearing our country apart. It's kind of ambiguous, but I like the way it sounds. Launch a major crackdown on government leakers who collude with the fake news to deliberately sow false narratives and to subvert our government and our democracy. So trying to break up the collusion between government and media, scheming against people with propaganda. That's been a problem in our country going back to the 60s and 70s. Number six, make every inspector general's office independent and physically separated from the departments they oversee so they do not become the protectors of the deep state. This one to me might have been the, the best one of, mm. in terms of just immediate impact on ending corruption. This to me shows Trump definitely understands how the system or the machine works and therefore he knows how to break it up. And yep. maybe this came from a Bobby Kennedy recommendation. I don't know, but I love it. I'm here for it. Yeah. Seven, ask Congress to establish an independent auditing system to continually monitor our intelligence agencies. This is incredible. I know. This might be the, the most quickly impactful thing is to get the CIA and the FBI especially monitored and, sur and surveilled so that they cannot continue to propagandize and brainwash and psyop the American people. I think most people think that the CIA is the organization that has been controlling the deep state for many, many decades that the CIA was really the people running the Obama campaign, the Biden campaign, and then the Kamala campaign. I think that's probably the case. There's some great evidence for that. 
But nonetheless, these two organizations have assassinated presidents, have created countless psyops, 9-11 in my opinion, they were involved in. We could go on and on and on. COVID, this is where so much of the evil comes from, is these three-letter intelligence agencies that have become totally captured by the deep state. And so he says, we're going to establish an auditing and monitoring system. I mean, that's how you root out corruption, dude. Audit them and monitor them. And there's nowhere to hide anymore. The darkness thrives on hiding from the light, right? So this is a, an amazing way to bring light to these organizations. Number eight, continue the effort launched by the Trump administration to move parts of the sprawling federal bureaucracy to new locations outside the Washington swamp. So again, just decentralizing, breaking it up more and more. Nine, work to ban federal bureaucrats from taking jobs at the companies they deal with and that they regulate. And 10, push a constitutional amendment to oppose term limits on members of Congress. That's For huge sure. too, right? That's a big one. No more Nancy Pelosi's, no more Chuck Schumer's and um, what's the guy... Uh, Mitch McConnell, oh, he's God. like forever he, he politicians. Retired, right? He stepped down. Yeah. Yep. Thank God. Term limits are so important, man, to stop corruption. And if you can have a senator serve for 30 years, you've got a very broken system. 100%. So I love all of these moves, man, big time. Yeah. Damn. We've been telling if you he actually fourth does turning. Then, we'll have to wait and see. Fourth turning. For I mean, real, it's, man. it's wild how fast we we normalize things, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. just like, it's hard not to. Let me, I mean, uh, let me pull up this. Dude, if Trump even did me. one third of those things, I think we would all probably agree that we've entered a first turning. Yeah. You know, those are such massive moves to make to end corruption. I mean, we could stay in a fourth turning if the deep state decides to launch an all out war against the American people because of this, but I just don't see that happening. So I'm bullish on the uh, first turning, bro. Yeah, I definitely am. I'm just weathering my expectations because mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, egos exist on, on both sides. And I would say that the, the devil's advocate that I've seen from the truthers are that things are a little too quiet. And there's like... Quiet? In terms of like expected expected pushback hasn't been as crazy as expected from the left from the yeah. deep state mm -hmm. yeah but i mean it's really going to depend on like you know what goes down in the next year two years all right so kind of fits in with what you're talking about just of like things that are insane to see like yeah. am i really reading this double so, take it says FDA's war on public health is about to end. And this is a tweet from Robert Kennedy Jr. Rogan showed it on his episode with Theo Vaughn as well. This includes its aggressive suppression of psychedelics, peptides, stem cells, raw milk, hyperbaric therapies, chelating compounds, ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, vitamins, clean food, sunshine, exercise, nutraceuticals, and anything else that advances human health and can't be patented by pharma. The best part, if you work for the FDA and are part of this corrupt system, I have two messages for you. One, preserve your records, and two, pack your bags. <laughs> Sheesh. It's just like... You punches, bro. Yeah, I posted that in uh, in our community. It's like, am I really am I really reading this, right? There's, there's an I element know, right? of... I don't know if I'd call it like PTSD or like... You know when you've let you know when you've been let down or someone's been let down so many times that they like don't let themselves get hope, mm -hmm. like someone who's been abused or something. It's called being black pilled. Okay, there, <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. It's just one. the definition. Black, just like the soul <laughs> of that person. Black, like right, the so, void. Yeah, when you've been black pilled, it's kind of like I kind of feel like some of us are feeling like that lately, where it's like, oh yeah, big time. Is this is this real? That's the Is surreal like, feeling. Like I've been, I've been like researching, preparing for this a little bit more on the economic side, but like everything we do in the LUC has like been preparing for this moment. <laughs> and yeah. like, it feels like it happened at the time of filming this last week. Like it, 
it's obviously too early to say, but like, it really does feel like everything that, cause during 2020, I think a lot of us, I don't know where you were at on that, but myself and, um, my peer group during that time, a lot of us thought that these things were going to happen during 2020, but it, it was a little bit premature. Um, and then it swung the other way. And then we had a, a different, a different four years, but mm -hmm. I, you know, the mass awakening that occurred with everything that went on with the mandates and shutting things down and blah, blah, blah. It's now swung back the other way and, and it's swung back in a fashion that even though I've been preparing for it, researching it, preparing other people for it and talking about it, it's still like kind of hard to believe. I know. It's st do you feel that way? Oh yeah, man. I mean, this is the law of polarity, right? That every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And that's because everything has two polarities. So we see the pendulum swing and sometimes, you know, we've watched the left aggressively pushing the pendulum this way for four years. I mean, in ways we, n none of us ever thought or could have conceived of the ways they would push the pendulum with some of the radical ideology and uh, government uh, policy decisions that are mind blowing, uh, open borders, woke ideology. None of us could have seen this coming. And so they pushed the pendulum so hard that of course we're seeing an equal and opposite counter reaction. Yeah. And to me, Jeremy, the reason why this was also such a huge win for the collective consciousness was that this election just was so clearly to me and to every single like friend that I have, you, you included, we talked about this over text, Anyone I know who's who I consider genuinely wise or tapped in spiritually was saying this as well, which is that this is really just an election between truth and delusion. And people are only seeming to vote for Trump or Kamala, but it's like you're really making a choice of are you still swayed by illusions or are you committed to truth? Because that was how polarized these two campaigns were. In every conceivable way, it's it's really fascinating to break down the way these two campaigns just ran. And we kind of already have done that a little bit. Yep. But specifically, like, look at Trump, right? Trump clearly represents truth and reality because no one has ever accused Trump of being fake or p playing a character, right? Trump gets criticized for being himself, for being authentic is why people hate him. So Trump has never played a character or pretended to be somebody he's not. He's just like, here's who I am. Here's what I think and believe. And if you agree, then let's rock. And then you look at um, Kamala Harris, for example. And this, this was always my thing with, with Kamala. If I was a voter, I wouldn't know how I could possibly have voted for Kamala because I have no idea who Kamala Harris really is. I'm sure that she is a real woman with who's intelligent and has real thoughts of her own. But unfortunately, that's not the, the Kamala they allowed us to see during her campaign. We only got to see this very strange, you know, cackling, um, platitude delivering person who never talks like a real person, who almost refuses, almost insultingly refuses to answer questions in interviews. It's very strange, right? Like if you're going to vote for somebody, you want to know that you're voting for that person, right? Not the team of, of handlers that control them. And so when you only ever see somebody reading off a teleprompter, how can you feel confident you're voting for that person instead of the one who wrote that script for that person? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. You can't know that. And so like we watched Kamala in her interviews like she just always gives these sort of long, strange platitudes that make no sense. In all the interviews I watched of her, it was like, I never saw her directly answer a single question. No. She sort of just talks around the issues with lots and lots of virtue signaling words. Like, um, you know, the Brett Baer interview on Fox, for example, he's like, so what's your policy going to be for the border if you're elected? And Kamala says something like, well, you know, Brett, we value our borders, okay? because our borders are what keep us safe. And a safe country is a country that, that allows safe. children. <laughs> What's that? And a safe country is a country that is safe. <laughs> that is safe. <laughs> it's a safe country that's safe for children, safe for 
all races of people, safe for all genders, safe for all sexual orientations, to have the same opportunity to achieve their visions, aspirations, and dreams. And Brett Bear's like, the question was, what is your policy going to be on the border if you're elected? And it was every time it's like that. So it's like, okay, this isn't a real person we're watching. Meaning, of course, there is a real Kamala Harris. That's not what I'm saying. So like we don't know who the real Kamala Harris is. Yeah, we don't know. She's, we'd have no idea. I have no idea what Kamala Harris, to this day, I have no idea what she wanted to do. Like, subjectively speaking. I never heard her really say what she would want to do with the country. Yeah policy-wise, if she was elected. So how do you, how could you expect me to vote for her, right? She's obviously got the whole machine writing her scripts and a team of people controlling her interviews and editing them and getting the questions beforehand and writing the answers. It's just so incredibly cringy, inauthentic. Yeah. So it's like, I, if you're an honest person, you're thinking, I can't vote for somebody I don't know. It's, it's quite obvious to me that a vote for Kamala really is just a vote for the legion of deep state handlers controlling her yeah. and I don't know who any of those people are or what their intentions are and then paradoxically right Kamala's closing speech conceding the election to Trump I thought was by far that was, best was the best speech of her campaign didn't you oh yeah I'll, uh contrarian take here it's almost as if she felt relief and let it probably rip. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> why, why was the best speech she gave after she lost? Well, here's my theory. Okay. Her speech had a very different feel to it, didn't it? Did. It did. New writer? Why. What's that? Did they fire the writers that lost in the election and got a no, new No, I think they fired Kamala. <laughs> okay. I think what happened was the the deep state group of handlers who are used to controlling candidates, right? they probably were so upset at the freaking blowout loss that they were watching. And they've all, you know, they're invested billions of dollars into this campaign. Racks. Yeah, and they're just probably fuming at this blowout loss. And so I bet you on election night, the reason Kamala didn't come out is because her handlers probably cast her aside, just like they cast Biden aside. Damn. And were like, all right, loser, we're done with you. Write yeah. your own damn goodbye speech and walked out the door. And so Kamala's like, okay, I will write my own closing speech, <laughs> you know? Well, and she then, crushed it. Yeah, and she told her, um, one of her admins or whatever, the guy comes out and he's like, hey, you're not going to see Kamala tonight. She'll give a speech tomorrow at four o'clock. Everyone's all upset. But I'm like, I think it's because she wants to write her own speech. And lo and behold, it was her best speech of the campaign. I don't know if that's true, but it's yeah. the intuition I'm getting, right? This flip-flop was so crazy to watch. If... If you're paying attention, right, this is one of the things we say is the strategy of the negative polarity is that they want to just fire hose the public with nonstop chaos and problems and fearful things and challenges so that we don't really have the ability to really analyze things that are happening, right? Because it's a fire hose. The next thing is already coming. Once yeah. the last thing happened, the next thing's coming down the pipe. And you're like, oh, what's happening next? Nobody has the chance to really say, wait a minute. That was really strange what just happened. Let's investigate how that happened and who was behind it. It's like, you don't have time to do that when the next PSYOP is barreling down the gun towards you. You're just trying to hang on for dear life. And that's what the American people have felt for so long. So to watch this flip-flop in the language of specifically Kamala and Biden, and to a large extent, the, the left media outlets as well. But didn't you see in Kamala's speech, she was like, guys, I know some of you are worried and afraid, but it's all going to be fine. This is America yeah. and we're strong together and stuff. Biden, same thing. It's, we're going to be fine. There's a yeah. good day going forward ahead for us. We're Americans. We're in it together. Mainstream media, same relieved. thing. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is such an egregious insult to America's intelligence, isn't it? Literally not 24 hours ago, you guys were running segments about Trump's... Um, uh, rally. I can't remember where it was. Oh, uh, Madison Square Garden. Yep. They were running nonstop coverage of the Madison Square Garden event, comparing it to Nazi rallies yeah. and saying Trump is definitely <laughs> a fascist Hitler. Yeah. If Trump gets elected, it will be the end of America. Yeah. Start of World War Three. We're all going to die if Trump gets elected because he is the reincarnation of Hitler. Yeah. 24 hours later, it's going to be fine. We're going to be fine. 
whoa, 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 which is it? Did we just elect Hitler or is it all going to be fine? Because both of those things can't coexist. If we just elected Hitler, you should have watched Kamala and Biden and all the left media saying, oh no, we're doomed. Flee the country, flee the country. And you should see thousands of people leaving the country on jets right now, if people really believed that. So what it shows is that this was just the egoic attack languaging yeah. that the media chose to, to feed people's egos the fear and stoke the fear of, oh no, he's Hitler, he's Hitler. But the second he wins, they're like, ah, just kidding. We were just trying to pull your vote. 100%. It's like, that's why people are burnt out. Did you see Jimmy Fallon crying about not sending money to Ukraine? <laughs> yeah. Or sorry, did you Jimmy see, Kimmel. Did you see Tom Hanks? I knew who you meant. Did you see Tom Hanks uh, supposedly said he's leaving or that he left? I didn't see that. Because there's so many celebrities that did that stupid shit, right? If Trump wins, mm -hmm. I'm leaving. And it's like, now a lot of people on Twitter are like tagging him like, are you leaving? Like, you got to keep yep. your word. <laughs> Yep. Like but as if the, that was a bad thing, because that's part to me, that's part of uh, this almost synonymous with with draining the swamp is like getting a lot of these. Uh, yeah. These people well, that for some reason are are idolized, even though they're. Well, not anymore. They're not. We saw that for sure. Yeah. All the celebrity stuff didn't work at all this time. But I know what the Jimmy Kimmel segment represented to me where he's he starts to cry on camera talking about Trump winning and stuff. And um, when he gets to Ukraine, he was like, this is a, a tragic day for, you know, uh, people of color, for women, for gay people. And he goes on the, th the tangent. He's like, and for our friends in Ukraine. <laughs> and he kind of breaks down. And I was like, and that's why you lost. 100%. You know, like that's why you got destroyed in the election, because people are so sick of that stuff. That's so weird. You're crying about a country that you probably can't point to on a map. You're crying about not sending billions of dollars to fuel war, to kill millions of people. You're sad about that. We should keep the war going. It's crazy. It's like you are so out of touch with the American people. And this is what I think the deep state learned. The negative polarity learned this, right? You can't control people and be up to speed with them and understand their daily lives. Like those things contradict each other. You control someone because you don't respect them or want to be part of their daily life. You want them to be um, a cog in your system, right? And so we have the, the political Washington elites who are, you know, uh, colluding, insider trading, making hundreds of millions through their, their government position, looking down from their high castle at the American peasants, you know, from their silk bed sheets being like, I wonder what the peasants are doing today. <laughs> they, they look down at the average person so much because they're so divorced from the average person. They live in the world of Washington corruption, right? And so how could they possibly be in touch with American culture? They're not. And this is what they showed us all. And remember, we've been saying this, bro, on our show for months, for the last year, we've been saying Guys, stop giving these people so much power in your mind. They are not as smart as you say or think they 100%. are. They are not as tapped in as you think they are. 100%. In fact, they make a lot of stupid, blunderous decisions that fire back in their face very quickly. And we just watched this entire election as a perfect example of that. Every single thing Kamala's campaign team did backfired. lowered her in the polls. Yes, backfired. Taylor Swift endorses Kamala. Trump's poll spikes, Kamala's dips. On and on, every celebrity endorsement, yep. every commercial, every ad. I mean, dude, every did you see new the... podcast she would go on, tank. Like when they yes. found out she, they edited, ABC edited that part out, tanked. Like it kept yeah. going, like, where are the tears for North Carolina? Right. Where are the tears for, for that part of. Of the U.S. only getting seven hundred dollars, but not actually getting any money. It's just, it's wild, man. The the virtue signaling, like the the appeal to more, is that what it is? Like a, the appeal to moral ver is vertitude a word? Like moral virtue is yeah bananas. It, it is crazy how effective it is that it will bypass these parts of your brain that go. Wait a minute. Like I'm an American and mm -hmm. and my money's being stolen from me every year and, and this person is like lying in my face for a living and and my my <laughs> family my that lives in the, that lives a few states over they they literally lost their house and their home and no one came to save them and they wouldn't let helicopters come in and pick them up and 
and no one's even talking about it anymore. And they sent 200 billion they just to sent Ukraine more at the to same Ukra- time. Like it just bypasses all of that. And it's like, what? you're not, mm-hmm. you're not a kind human. You don't yeah. stand for, oh, I get it. You're a Nazi. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah. it's like, wait, what? <laughs> How did we go from that? To, like, well, those are two, oh, bro. It's because those are two very common strategies of the human ego mind. Yeah. Number one, the ego will always overlook logic and reason in the in place of appearing virtuous. Appearing virtuous is like the most important task for ego because ego is that part of our mind that desperately wants and needs the approval of other people. And there's no way to raise your status in the social hierarchy faster than to appear virtuous and shine virtue to everyone because that's how the ego perceives its value in the hierarchy going up. And then the second thing is that the ego, when it disagrees with somebody, it always tries to turn that person they disagree with. Like it doesn't want to see the true reality of the person. It wants to turn them into the furthest, most extreme version of them it can create. Yeah. Like, like you just said, if you say, I don't want to go spend $200 billion on a foreign war, they'll say, well, you, you could only possibly want that because you're a Nazi. Yeah. See, that the ego looks for the most extreme possible thing it can label you, and then it attacks you as if you are that thing, as if it's already true and settled, right? This is a strategy we see from the woke left, is that anyone who disagrees with me is racist, evil, misogynistic, etc. And they're trying to do to you what they're doing to themselves. They're trying to scare you into wanting virtue so bad that you say, no, I'm not a racist. Uh, I take it back. I don't believe that. They're trying to scare you out of your position with false light. And so it's, it's the way the ego wields false light that allows it to control people's minds. And it's happened in our country in a huge way, in large part, thanks to mostly thanks to the media, um, you know, causing this Trump derangement syndrome. But it's like it, it genuinely feels like the country, half, like a segment of the country, not even half, but a, a substantial segment of the country is like brains have gotten broken from the media where they just believe whatever they see a news anchor say on a television screen. And I saw this tweet from David Icke that I really appreciated. Um, did you see this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I didn't see David Icke because I saw the Laura Loomers. Have Why you would seen, you enjoy you know, the tears, all... disappointment, and distress of others, however much you would agree to? Is that what we've come to? Wow. So have you seen all of the more right-wing you know, yeah, uh, yeah, the right wing people kind of dunking on them, being a little dunking bit, uh, and all the reaction videos. Like they, they they don't feel any remorse. Yeah, like uh, here's a video any where you empathy. can drink liberal tears for ten minutes. You know, yeah. watching the liberals cry over the election. Yeah, and it's so sad to see that. I'm like, look how hateful we are, man. We're so yeah. divisive as a country that we enjoy people suffering. Yeah. And every single video or picture I see of a like a radical left person like screaming at the camera with tears in their face and stuff, it just makes me feel sad for them and deep compassion. I don't yeah. want to see somebody hurt like that. And so although I disagree with a lot of what David Icke says, I really appreciated his take on this. Why would you enjoy the tears and disappointment and distress of others, even if you disagree with them? Is that what we've come to? And I, I love that because that's the wake up call that we need to hear right now. We, we need unity so bad. We've got to get over this division of I'm right, you're wrong, you know. And I want to say this too to like people watching this who may be overwhelmed with sadness and fear about Trump's victory as if something terrible has occurred. Just like I did in 2020 when um, I wasn't looking forward to seeing four years of another deep state controlled candidate. And, um, you know, it was what I thought it was. It was, every, it was way worse than I could have imagined in terms of the, <laughs> the things that actually happened. You know, I had to remind myself of this back then that, you know, okay, the deep state's coming back into power in Washington, which means it's going to be a rough four years. And boy, was it. But I could have never predicted just how bad things actually would get in America And yet, look at what it's done. It's caused this incredible movement, this incredible unity. And so we all look back and did you also see some of the stats about um, why the deep state desperately wishes that they hadn't rigged the 2020 election? I did, yeah. But that that Trump had won? Yeah. Yeah. I I hadn't considered that point of view. It makes a lot of sense. Pendulum swung. 
it does, right? If Trump had won in 2020, he would have um, a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House. So they would have stymied Trump on any decision he wanted to make. And then um, there was another big benefit why I'm blanking on it now. But it basically showed that like, oh, this is the worst nightmare for the deep state, a total sweep for Trump. I mean, this is the last thing they wanted to happen. And that's because God always has a plan in everything. So if you're feeling scared about this, if you believe what you've been told about Trump being a fascist and stuff, just remember God's will. Rely upon God's will. Pray for God to reveal God's will in this to you, to show you how God is using Trump. And this is there's always a good outcome guaranteed when you trust in God's will. So the, to me, like there's just no doubt that the universe is using Trump as the most powerful mirror that our planet's ever seen. Because when people look at Trump, they either see a reflection of their light or their darkness. You know, some people say, yeah, Trump has said some unkind things and has an ego and brags too much and stuff, but so do I. And so I've said many unkind things in my life. And would I want someone to judge me for those things I've said in the past? No, it's very arrogant to do that. And so most people go around, you know, thinking horrible, unkind things about people all day in their mind, and yet are quick to point the finger at somebody when they catch them saying a bad statement 10 years ago or something. It's so prideful. It's like, we're all, we all think horrible things in our minds. Like the, the ego thinks bad things and Oftentimes we even say those things and we regret them. So it's like, if you have done the spiritual work on yourself to meet your shadow, to forgive your shadow, to forgive your pride and egotism, then you easily forgive it in other people. You fully understand everyone's on a journey. The human experience is really tough. The ego is very strong. It's not easy to be a balanced person in this world. So I understand if people struggle with their ego. I, I struggled with mine, right? This is why Trump is the ultimate catalyst. Trump literally pulls the shadow out of people and brings it to the surface because people who struggle with pride themselves will be irritated by Trump's pride. People who hold prejudice and judgment towards others will see Trump as a racist or a misogynist. Uh, people who it's it's people who lie will get upset at Trump's lying. Like it's all projection. All judgment is projection, period. It's an undebatable fact. You do not judge others if you, have, if you don't have a shadow that you're trying to protect. That's the mechanism of projection, right? If you have, a, if you have strong negative feelings about anybody, Trump, Kamala, Joe Biden, you name it, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means that your ego's still attempting to project a shadow onto them. And so you should want to look at those judgments and say, wow, I get really angry when I see videos of Trump or Biden or whoever. I wonder where this is coming from in me. You know, if I, if I hate someone else's pride, where am I prideful? If I notice myself getting irritated by someone else's greed for wealth, where am I still greedy? If I hate somebody for, for lying, where am I still lying to myself? This is the way a mature person deals with their projections rather than just casting them on other people mm. um, all the time. If you feel triggered when people disagree with you, right? That's also a sign that there's some imbalances in your mind that need attention, that need healing. And so it's a surefire way to create endless suffering for yourself, to expect people to agree with your opinions. Because guess what? There's always gonna be people that disagree with you. So if you can just give love to people who agree with you, but you can't give love to people who don't agree with you, where's the virtue in that? Even the worst people on our planet do that, right? Even the most negatively polarized people love people that agree with them and hate people that disagree with them. There's no virtue at all in being angry against people that disagree with you. Loving people who disagree with you is the sign of spiritual virtue. And so if you disagree with anything I say or anything Jeremy says, you have every right to do so. Disagreeing is fine and very welcome. But please don't make the mistake of believing that your perspective is a fact or that your interpretation is a fact, right? All perspectives are very limited. Just because you think something about a person does not mean someone else thinks that too. And I assure you that whoever you disagree with has just as much evidence to support their position as you think you do, right? Everyone has evidence to support their position. However strong or flimsy that evidence may be, everybody feels right in what they believe. 
And so we have to rise above this petty ego game of arguing and debating everyone who doesn't agree with us. And hopefully America is starting to do that now. We'll see, but we at some point have to stop playing the game of right and wrong. I'm right, you're wrong. And we have to start accepting each other regardless of our differences. Even though we may disagree on things, you're still my divine brother or sister and I love you. Who you are is more important to me than me being right about my opinion. And I just feel like this amazing super team that's formed around Trump, made up of largely Democrats, represents a shift in that direction. You're making way too much sense, Aaron. <laughs> way <laughs> too much down, common huh? sense for... Someone better censor me. For November 2024, you can't be talking like that. All right, <laughs> I'll, too, I'll pull it back. It's too rational. <laughs> <laughs> man. It might be. Very well said, man. And I appreciate the, uh, the beautiful perspectives. I want to I wanna speak a little bit now. I haven't pulled up any sort of clips or anything. I definitely want to want to talk a little bit about the uh, economic implications, right? Mm -hmm. This is a little bit more in <clears throat> in my wheelhouse and some of the stuff that we've been preparing our students for. Now, to clarify, a lot of times throughout this entire year since me and Aaron started the show, when you guys hear me talk about um, Trump or Republicans or or whatever it may be, most of the time I'm speaking from a perspective of uh, being an investor and, and a capitalist. So like a lot of my stances aren't exactly things that I personally like care about. Like it's more of what would benefit the economy more or what would benefit mm -hmm. crypto more or whatever it is. Right. So like that's kind of my thought process just to clarify. So I study the markets i study kind of the the behind the scenes stuff of like what what would actually come of a kamala win what would come of a kamala win with a republican house or a senate so like mixed right what would come of a trump win with with democrat house or senate yeah smart these types of things and and that's really what matters um when you're an investor or, you know, like your black rocks your fidelity your state street your vanguards like you better believe they spent millions and millions and millions of dollars getting an edge on yeah. which how to adjust their allocations and and how to weigh risk and how to position in a way where you know they're they're not missing too much upside by being a little uh, a little too late but at the same time they're not risking too much downside if for somehow you know a uh, uh, a win that they weren't expecting gets pulled off and stuff. So these are just, you know, the nature of markets and that's the majority of what I care about. Like I said, I'm not like, uh, you know, a lot of voters are voting on issues like, uh, abortion or, uh, taxes or, um, unemployment, things that just don't particularly affect me. Right. So I'm not like, I don't particularly, um, I don't want to say I don't I don't care about them, but that's not what what pulls me in, right? Yeah. What I have been focusing on for the last twelve months in in my research and some of what I've been trying to drop here and there and on the show in terms of gems is like what's coming, right? Because this show is all about the Great Awakening, and an aspect of that is shifting the polarity of why do the most corrupt people on this planet have all of the money and why do the people who are actually virtuous and actually have morals and and yeah. want to be of service to others generally like statistically speaking hold almost zero percent of the wealth right so yeah. that's kind of like a bit of my mission and what i try to help people do and so I don't know if you saw this, Aaron, but um, that, that was just a little bit of a preface. Now I'll get into it. So the S&P had the best single day post-election day in history, meaning like the day after the election. So that was yeah. Wednesday. The, be the biggest single day gain in the markets ever for a post-election day. Wow. What does that tell you about what the market is like the market is always giving feedback, right? So for example, throughout this entire election, um, I, I talked to you on numerous occasions about like poly market, right, Aaron? 
So you, you were yeah. able to see the betting markets way months in advance of who won the election were telling you something. And a lot of people discounted that. Oh, it's just betting market. It's not accurate. No, the economy is actually typically a lot more accurate than political systems. For example, look how much money it takes the government to like build a railroad. Have you heard Elon talk about that shit? Like yeah, 50 billion and they laid like a mile of track and it took two years or something. Crazy. Yeah. Give Elon one hundredth of that, one one hundredth of that. Mm-hmm. And he'll do it in half the time with one one hundredth of the budget. Which would be right? like 10 mil? So I, this is just a hypothetical. Mm-hmm. So my, my point is just like the economic markets are very accurate and you usually want to pay attention to them more than what the news is telling you or what the polls are telling you or what the political system might be telling you. So yeah, the, the market is the best place to go when you don't want ideology to influence your opinion. Yep. Because when it you're doesn't betting care. money, yeah, you don't want ideology anywhere near you, yourself when you're betting money. You want the cold, hard facts and nothing else. And so we, the markets tell us a lot, right, about what people really think. 100%. So quick read through. Uh, it says stocks hit all-time highs, U.S. yields jumped, and the dollar saw its best day since 2022 with investors mapping out Donald Trump's return to presidency and the potential for Republicans to win both houses of Congress. S&P climbed 2.5% in a day, which for an index that only does 8% average a year, 2.5% in a day is pretty insane. Uh, the VIX, which is kind of like the fear uh, volatility and like fear, fear index dropped heavily. So what I've been, what, uh, what I've been telling my students is like, it doesn't matter. It's not about like voting. It's not about Republican or Democrat. It's not about any like individual issues. If you like money, if you desire wealth increase over the next four years, the policies that Trump and Vance and that whole, uh, call it a cabinet if you want, are extremely bullish. Bullish meaning beneficial for the markets. And this article is yeah. kind of, you know, reflecting that. For now, investor sentiment is pro-growth, pro-deregulation, which is very bullish, right? And pro-markets. There's also an assumption There's also an assumption that mergers and acquisitions activity will pick up and that more tax cuts are coming. This creates a strong backdrop for stocks, right? So this is obviously, shout out to my students. They've been crushing it. Um, we've had a very good <laughs> four days. And then mm-hmm. we have the Trump trade. I don't know if you've uh, heard of this, but Bitcoin, Tesla, some of these things have been astronomically up in a matter of like four trading days, which I'll get into in a second. It says... Um, So just an update, guys, because we've been talking about Bitcoin all year. And I think we first started talking about it around $30,000, Aaron. Can you read that price for me? 68? 88. Is it too small? Oh, sorry. The highlighted section. $88,000. Yep. And it tagged $89,500 before pulling back. At the time we're filming this, I don't know where it will be when it releases, but pretty crazy to see, man. Almost a 90,000 Bitcoin gain of 27% just since the election day. And then we have um, uh, Tesla is up over 50% just just since the election day. No way. 50%? 50%. Yeah. That's, that is uh, my largest holding and I've been waiting for this. You're sitting pretty right now, dude. Oh yeah. Bitcoin, Tesla, we're doing great. But a lot, so are my students. And a few things I want to say about this. Elon is extremely smart for doing what he did with Twitter. He's playing like a 5D chess at a whole other level that I don't think people can even fathom. I wouldn't be surprised if he had the foresight as part of why he bought Twitter, knowing that if the Democrats won another election, he couldn't achieve his goals. And this comes back to that conversation about ego yeah, and why yeah, it's yeah. not always a bad thing. My man's trying to fly rockets to Mars and the bureaucracy will has so much red tape that they will not approve his test flights and some of the things that he needs to get approved in a meaningful yep. timeline. They are so slow and so outdated 
that he has an incentive. Remember, capitalism is all about incentives. He has an economic incentive to try to get someone in there that has common sense for his own agenda. Is that a bad thing? Does that make him the devil? That's up to you to decide. I think there's a reasonable chance that he had that foresight in regards to that. Also, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on here, but the Biden campaign and the left for some reason hates uh, Elon and Tesla. That's part of why he shifted campaigns, Mm -hmm. but specifically Tesla. They will not promote or endorse Tesla for everything it's done as the number one United States pure ev automaker yeah they so they talk about and praise gm and and honda and ford and they have trash evs that sell like 150th of what uh tesla sells and mm-hmm. tesla's the only profitable ev maker and yet they won't even wow. speak to its name yeah every yeah. other company even rivian even the lucid the ones that look really cool there's they lose about forty thousand dollars per car aaron they lose forty thousand dollars per car whoa and tesla has insane free cash flow and profit margins and yet they, they biden you won't see him once saying good no. job to tesla at all they just what don't the, like um, him and so they've exiled him they've pushed him out of the democratic camp and mm-hmm. i think elon had the foresight to realize once again, 5D chess, we're talking years out to realize like, if I can buy this platform and make it the number one free speech platform on earth and use my influence of how many hundreds of, I don't know how many followers he has. I think over a hundred million, the most followers like second to like Trump or something on Twitter, I can use my influence to shift the outcome of the American presidential campaigns, the, the Mm -hmm. election essentially. I Just really like feel like he played a key does. role in that. And I don't think I'm alone, Aaron, because, I mean, Tesla went from 220 to 350 um, oh my in, in like four days. I mean, that's it's, insane. I didn't even know about that. Oh, this. yeah, bro. I mean, we were talking, I was telling you about God candles before this. It was just <sighs> like, you know, so obviously that's cool to see. But honestly, all that is, is the market trying to play catch up. Because there's yeah. been a, a lot of money sitting on the sidelines that hadn't allocated yet because they were waiting for a president. And a Kamala president would have been horrible. I mean, they were going to deplatform Elon. They were going to remove oh, Twitter. They were very adamant about that. They yeah. would have, you know, they would have sabotaged and not approved any sort of regulation needed for Starlink. You know, they would have made things mm-hmm. difficult with ta- EV tax credits and regulation around autonomous self-driving and stuff with Elon, the things he needs to prove to benefit, yep. right? Which trickles down to investors. So I think that reallocation is just a sign of that. Same thing with crypto. Why is all the money flooding in now? Well, we obviously People have JD Vance who literally owns Bitcoin. He's good friends with, uh, Peter Thiel, meaning he understands AI. Peter Thiel's the co-founder of PayPal. He's was an early investor, co-founder of Palantir. He deeply understands AI. He's debatably transhumanist. I don't I don't need mm. to get into that, but everyone has, you know, their everyone has their opinion. Their shit. It doesn't it doesn't mean that these things can't be um, used for good. But my point is we've never had a president who owns tech stocks. We've never had a president who owns Bitcoin. Um well, that's vice president. Then our the president is launching literal like NFTs and his own coin. It's like this is insane, right? So it is. Um, few thoughts here is just, I mean, Trump is literally out here talking about getting rid of the IRS. He's talking about firing Gary Gensler. I don't know if um, you know about this, Aaron, but Gary Gensler has been the head of the SEC, the Securities yeah. and Exchange Commission, and their job is to supposedly protect the everyday investor insanely from insanely like, corrupt you know. organization. But in reality, what they do is they do things like make it so that um, only accredited investors who are already, you have to be already a millionaire have access to like early stage investments, for example. And they say it's to protect them. Well, they do, they've been doing the same thing for years with crypto where they say, Oh, it's, it's, there's a lot of money laundering and fraud and, and it's unregulated. Like we can't let you use it. Right. So yeah, they delayed the ETFs for so long, calling them securities and 
fraudulent and they had no value and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, he, he literally has adamantly said one of the first things he's going to do is fire this guy. <laughs> that's just like hilarious. <laughs> Trump I love just it. doesn't mess around. So that should tell you everything you need to know about Trump's views on Bitcoin and how he feels about people that kind of like use their power to like stifle innovation. That's really what all of this is. What all of this is. I said it earlier, but the Democrats are supposed to stand for progression, innovation. Like there's a reason that young people tend to slant Democrat. And then as you age, you tend to become more conservative because like when you're young, you believe in like yeah. change and reform and innovation and doing things differently. And then as you get older, you kind of like, oh, I, I see the merit in like actually upholding tradition and blah, blah. Right. So mm -hmm. I digress about that. But my point is like, it's very interesting that the Democrats have become the party of stifling innovation. Like the last four yeah. years, the policies around United States in uh, artificial intelligence, United States approach to cryptocurrency, like yeah. the, the tech race, all space, these different things have been like, race. like electric vehicles and, and some of the, um, some of these different alternative energy sources, like they're stifling it like actively. It's as if their handlers are, Chinese or something. They're trying to make us lose yeah. the race and, and all that like competitiveness. Right. So it is very interesting. Like if you want the American people to prosper, you need to have less regulation here and more opportunities for advancement. And I think their model has been that, Oh, well, we'll just give you handouts and that'll, that'll make you satisfied. But people actually want to like work for it. They want to, they want to earn it. They want to have the opportunity to like compete and, and engage yeah. in the economy. They don't just want to be handed a stimulus check and, and sit at home or whatever. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, so those are like extremely bullish things that Trump has already been talking about. He's also talk talking about bringing Bitcoin mining to America as of wow. now, energy costs are expensive. So they typically do these things wow, overseas and they'll, they'll have these huge setups with a ton of Bitcoin miners and GPUs and massive electricity bills. But, but you actually earn Bitcoin for solving problems that validate the, um, the network. Wow. Well, he's talking about bringing all of that to America the same way he's talking about, yo, you got uh, American fortune 500 businesses. You got to set up shop here. Like, uh -huh. so that's going to be massive because he's Did basically you see his credit card thing. He's trying to cement Bitcoin as like, or us, the U S as like the, the Bitcoin mining hub and make us actually competitive in that, which will spur new businesses. Cause there's an entirely, there's entire businesses, publicly traded businesses that are Bitcoin yeah. mining businesses. Yeah. And so that will spur innovation. That's going to give a lot of jobs. It's going to give an incentive to drive electricity down, which is going to benefit everyone. Cause we don't have we need way more grid power to supply all this EV stuff, all this uh, Bitcoin mining stuff. I don't know if you've heard of this, but two of the main mm -hmm. constraints in, in scaling AI is lithium and electricity. And they need to solve those two problems. Um, is there something you were going to say before I continue? Did you see the credit card policy? I did, 10%. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I huge. mean, these are just like, aggress like every single one by itself is meaningful. He's dropping yeah. like a lot of big ones. So yeah, we'll see. Um, last thing on that note, I was going to say is he even, he mentioned he wants to fire Jerome Powell, which is hilarious. Um, yeah, I'll pull up the clips in a bit, but I mean, head of the federal reserve, just letting him know, like without publicly saying it, like, yo, you're, you're a private for, for profit copper corporation. Yeah. <laughs> and Powell's like, you can't do that. So, um, yeah. So at the time we're filming this right now, the last four to five days straight have been, like trading days, the days that the market were open because it's not open on the weekends. Crypto is, but the stock market isn't. Since Do you Trump have that won, clip of Jerome Powell? What'd you say? Do you have that clip of Jerome Powell? Yeah, yeah, I have two clips. I'd like to play that in a second. All right. Um, so the last four to five days have been incredibly bullish in the markets. Like Bitcoin already hit all-time highs. The S&P and the NASDAQ already hit all-time highs. They were close Whoa. just for clarity, but... But Bitcoin was ranging for months and months, ranging, yeah. ranging, and it's just so market is speaking. Tesla's up 50%, and many of the disruptive innovation investments that we teach in the LUC have been up literally triple digit returns this week. I've literally never seen, Aaron, since I started the LUC in January 2020. So we're coming up on five years. I have never seen more student wins in our community than I have the last few days. 
Like yeah. it has actually like been making me emotional and there's been so many. I'll, I'll have our teams share some of the wins on the screen for you guys, just so you can see like what is possible and, and kind of like why I've been so hopeful that, you know, we get this election behind us and that some of these shifts happen. Like it, it doesn't have anything to do with me thinking that Trump is the savior or that, Oh, now these policies are going to change our, like it's, I am much more libertarian in stance. And I think that we all, I believe in people taking their individual power back. And so all I'm looking at is which presidential candidate allows for more individual opportunity for each of us, as well as each of our families. Mm -hmm. And one of those outcomes puts the market in an extremely bullish scenario. And one of those outcomes add some what you would call headwinds to the market, meaning like increases in regulation. She, she wanted to increase taxes. There were a lot of things that would have had a lot of wealth fleeing this country. Mm -hmm. And Trump is literally like, we're bringing everything back and we're taxing foreign insurgents, if you want to call them that. Yeah. And the crazy part is, Aaron, Trump hasn't even done anything yet. He hasn't even taken yeah. office yet. This is what you call like a, the market is like, trying to play catch up right now because they weren't allocated. Um, yeah. Real quick, last thing I'll say, and then I'll hand it off. So why is this happening in the markets? I mean, um, maybe my team can put a few, few pictures right now of like, you know, what has happened in the markets the last, the last week or so in terms of growth of the S and P NASDAQ, uh, Bitcoin, et cetera. This is solely because number one, we've had a red wave and the implications on the economy of that, right? lowering taxes, tariffs, uh, bringing jobs here. These are all very positive things. Interest rates are dropping. Number two, we have the liquidity cycle that I keep talking about, right? Aaron, you remember that kind of stochastic graph. The liquidity oh, cycle yeah. continues on. Now you add that with the backdrop of Trump wanting to cut taxes, tariffs, and all these different things. I mean, pro-innovation, it's game over. And the market yeah. is recognizing that, right? And then yep. here's, here's something I haven't talked about before. There is about $6.4 trillion on the sidelines right now, Aaron, in what you call money market funds that has been sitting there because interest rates were so high, you could earn a pretty decent yield with extremely low risk. But what happens when the interest rates come back down, Aaron? Now that money market fund that you could earn 5%, 5.5%, 6% in, it's not as attractive anymore because you're earning 3%. 3.5, 2.5. You'd probably rather reallocate somewhere you can get a little yeah. bit of a higher yield because that's not even keeping up with inflation, right? Yeah. So what is $6.4 trillion? <laughs> what is just even a fraction of that, say one or two trillion reallocated to the stock market or yeah. to Bitcoin? What is that going to do to to the price? Man. Right? So you picture, uh, you picture a fairly uh, large pool and a, a whale jumps in that thing. I mean, you know, that's going to lift Don't everyone. Make some in, waves. That's going to lift everyone in that pool, right? So, yeah. things to pay attention to, guys. Uh, there's a lot of money sidelined. So, when you see what has happened to Bitcoin the last week, just understand that this is in no means the top. It's not the, we're not in the first inning, but this is not at all the top. This is what you call catch up. People were under allocated. I think the Trump victory surprised a lot of people. And more than that, it, even if people were banking on it in terms of institutional money that was sitting on the sidelines, BlackRock, Fidelity, State Street, Vanguard, you know, the usual, they just can't risk allocating before there's a winner determined and getting that wrong. You, you can't, yeah. there's certain bets you just can't take when you're talking trillions. And so yeah. they, they just had to wait. And that gives people like you and me, Aaron, an advantage because we get to kind of front run the whales. And uh, you get to ride that that wave when the whale jumps in the pool. Yeah. And so that's what's happening right now, guys. I want to give just a temperature check. Liquidity cycle is beautifully, you know, underway. Nothing has changed there. S and P, Nasdaq, all time highs. I think we're going to see that see that trend continue through January, yeah. February before we potentially get a pullback, um, like of any significance. Right? There will always be ups mm -hmm. and downs, but. Um, and I think Bitcoin is, uh, as well as crypto is, is very primed for, you know, I don't know how long it's going to last. It depends how quickly this goes up, uh, the quicker it goes up, the quicker it's over. 
So we'll see. But um, I think the main thing I want to stress here is just that this is before Trump has even gotten into office. Mm -hmm. He hasn't even done any of these things. This is just forward looking liquidity that's being invested to position for what people think is going to happen. So when smart yeah. money places its bets, you want to pay attention to that. And yeah. the easiest way to know where is smart money placing its bets? Well, guys, they can't hide it. They're allocating so much money that it causes what I call God candles. Y you see it on the charts. You see it on price action. So go look at what is up the most in the last week. You're welcome. That's what smart money thinks is going to be the biggest winners. If you mm -hmm. have things that literally didn't even respond to a Trump victory, it's probably not going to perform that well during the next four years. If you have something <laughs> that's up, oh, I don't know, Aaron, maybe 50% in the last few days, <laughs> that's owned by a CEO that with a name that rhymes with Pilon, that's probably something that people are betting on is going to have a lot of bullish catalysts. Because once again, deregulation, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know, who, who does Elon need to meet with or persuade or influence to get things passed? Oh, I don't know, his good friend Trump? Or his other good, <laughs> good old friend buddy old Vance? Pal. I mean, they're <laughs> literally good friends now. So you're yeah. talking about being able to make one phone call and be like, yo, can you, these regulations are ridiculous. Can we like you know, recontract on some of these, make it make more sense that this yeah. is costing me, you know, 20 billion a year in, in taxes that doesn't even make sense. We, this could be reallocated towards helping the electrification of the entire United States grid. I'd rather use it towards that, but I'm paying the government so they can send it to Ukraine. Can we do something about this? You know, those types of things. And the market mm -hmm. is responding to that. So I would not overlook that guys. Um, it's the same way I wouldn't overlook the pro crypto regime. When you have the president and the VP both own uh, crypto and are on the blockchain, I mean, they have a personal selfish incentive to make that massively more adopted, popular, well-known, regulated in a healthy way and deregulated in a healthy way, meaning deregulating things that allow more of it to come to America and that make it easier for the average person to buy and own crypto and Bitcoin, but um, regulated in the sense that the checks and balances occur that allows as many people as possible to be able to safely use it, right? Because your average person isn't going to touch it if they feel like, oh, it's not regulated. So um, that's the majority of what I wanted to touch on for this section, just the economic piece. Very exciting. I think this is just the beginning of things. It's going to be a uh, very prosperous time in the markets, at least through 2025 with the liquidity cycle. I don't know if we'll have some sort of um, recession or challenges come 2026 because the president can't the president doesn't actually dictate or influence the liquidity cycle. It's above even that, right? Yeah. So he might have very bullish policies with low taxes and innovation and bringing things here. And it will be a very interesting study in real time to see, can that negate the contraction of our money supply and the liquidity cycle on the other end when we come back down? Uh, we will see, but, uh, regardless, yeah. the next 12 months is going to be beautiful. I'm incredibly happy for our students. I know you guys all watch this. So shout out to you guys. As I mentioned, we'll put a bunch of you on the screen with your names censored. Um, you know, it just really, really makes me happy and, and feel incredibly yeah. grateful to be able to do what I'm doing. And we basically serve the same kind of person, Aaron. So it's just, you know, to see people with such pure hearts, like winning, uh, really makes me happy. And, um, you know, that's all me and Aaron want for you guys. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm hopefully with you, more of that it's, to come. It's such a great thing to see that people are hopeful again. Yes. The economy's picking up again. Yeah. Um, everything you just said, everything you just showed us about the economy and the way the economy has responded to me shows that the rhetoric about Trump being a fascist and stuff has just totally worn off on the public. Because it's like, well, number one, what do you mean he's a fascist? He was already president for four years and he ended wars and he went overseas to meet with our adversaries and became friends with them and made peace with them. What do you mean he's a fascist? It, it doesn't work anymore. 
And so the economy as a more, as a metaphor for who's in power, to me, the economy really shows the true intentions of those in power. Because yes, any, you know, any well-meaning president could have a, um, a downturn in the economy. Things can happen that make the economy suffer for a bit. But if it's just one bleeding wound after another, year after year after year, and inflation just keeps going up, uh, the public's wealth keeps going down, and the transfer keeps going more and more to the 1%, and the banks, like if this keeps happening... The economy to me is the greatest mirror of the true intentions of those in power. Because yes, it's a complex subject. Yes, it requires great skill and intelligence and stuff. But at the, at the same time, like I think you would agree, Jeremy, just to run a decently well-functioning economy isn't really rocket science. There's just some basic obvious things you need to do to avoid disasters happening in your economy. And from there it gets more nuancy, but like, this is one of the other illusions of the negative polarity is that every president, every politician acts like, man, you know, running this country, it's so dang hard. You know, we're trying our best, but all the money keeps going to the 1%. We keep having wars and ha, it's just so tough. <laughs> and it's like, no, you people are making all those things happen. And we don't believe your propaganda that it's just so hard to run a good country. It's like El Salvador just proved you all wrong in about 18 months because <laughs> they were number one in crime, extremely impoverished. And, um, is it Butele is his name? Uh, I always Nayeb. blank on his name. Bukele, I think. Nayeb Bukele, yeah. Yes. That guy just proved them all wrong. He completely turned that country around in like a year and a half. One of the lowest crime rates on earth now. Booming economy. They're doing so well as a country. Some Americans are moving there for crying out loud. So it's like, no, it isn't so hard to run a good economy. It's that you're using the economy as a tool to transfer wealth to yourself, right? At the expense of the American people. So I feel like we're also in an interesting moment of history as far as it concerns the positive and negative polarity on the planet. Because I'm looking at the negative polarity and the way they just got monkey stomped in this election, wasted billions of dollars trying to get their next controlled puppet candidate into office, and it woefully failed. And again, Trump has totally changed the landscape of all the different weapons that they had and tactics they would always use to win. Trump just kind of pulled the rug out from under them and took away those tactics. Now it's like, you can't use mainstream media to make your candidate win. You can't rely upon short, quick sound bites with teleprompters to you know, get your candidate public exposure. You've gotta be a real person who goes on real podcasts and has real conversations. And if people don't know who you really are, they're not going to vote for you. You know, this is one of the reasons why I don't think they wanted Kamala to go on Rogan or PBD or any of the podcasts Trump did. It's not like people gave Kamala such a hard time that she's like stupid and stuff. And my take was a little different. It's like, no, I think she's probably a very intelligent woman. I just think she's being forced to play a character because that's how it goes, right? She would never be in this position to run for president without the deep state. They didn't even have a democratic election for her, right? They just kind of shooed her in and shooed Biden out. She, she wouldn't, there's no way she would have won a democratic convention as we talked about before. She didn't even make it to Iowa in 2020. She didn't even get one single vote. And you expect me to believe she would have beaten Gavin Newsom or Pete Buttigieg, like no chance. And so- the benefit that Kamala got is, hey, I have a good chance of being president. In exchange, I have to do what these people say. And so she did what they said. She played the character they wanted her to play. And so they didn't want her going on real podcasts to expose who she really is because they don't want people to see who she really is. They want people to see the manicured, you know, cardboard cutout version of her that they've curated for you to see. And so in addition to everything you just said, I'm gonna play this video um, because this, this video discusses all the ways that, um, all these good things that have happened since Trump won the election. There's a, a parable that Jesus told that says, you always know a tree by its fruit. A bad tree does not bear good fruit and a good tree doesn't bear bad fruit. And you know we look at the Biden-Harris administration from 2020 to 24, 
they very much present themselves like we're such incredibly good people. We care so much. We All we care about is virtue and helping others. And then they went on to have the most corrupt four years we've ever seen and, you know, just destroyed so many aspects of American society and systems in the last four years that we're limping along right now as a country and hopefully going to get some recovery now. But that's that's a sign that it was a bad tree, right? It doesn't matter what somebody says or who, how they pretend to be. It matters what they really do in actuality. And whatever criticisms you may have about Trump, and I had I had criticisms about decisions he made, right, in his first term. I didn't agree with everything he did. But overall, oh my gosh, it's not even close. There's not another presidency in my lifetime or that I can really think of in history as good as Trump's first term. No new wars, booming economy, opportunity for everybody, jobs up, unemployment down, homelessness all-time low, crime all-time low, border all-time low in so many states. It was an awesome four years to be an American. And so although Trump may have flaws, you know a tree by its fruit. He clearly intends good things for the country if good things keep happening under his administration. And so this is a, a really great video highlighting all the effects, the good effects, the good fruits, rather, that have already happened, like you just pointed out, and you touched on sort of the economic ones, but a lot of these have to do with foreign policy and other things. So let's check this little Instagram reel out. Donald Trump's not even president yet. Have you seen what's happened in the last 48 hours? The misogynist appoints the first ever woman to be chief of staff. The Taliban announced they want peace with America and to be taken off the terrorist list. Putin came out and said that Western civilization is not an enemy. Mexico has started securing the border in, of course, response to tariff threats. Saudi Arabia is kicking out all of their Hamas leaders. New York is cleaning up their illegal migrant crisis. Xi Jinping came out and said he wants to peacefully coexist with China and said that they respect American people. The European Union chief finally came out and said, hey, America, can we start buying LNG from you so they stop buying from Russian gas? Putin says he takes Donald Trump's plan to end the war with Ukraine very seriously and Russia supports it. The these are stepping back. The Hamas called for an immediate end to war. He's calling for term limits in from Congress so that way people like Nancy Pelosi stop being forever members. Stock markets and crypto hit all-time highs. He sent Kamala Harris and Hillary Clinton into depression. Because of all of this amazing news, white, liberal, ugly women are now refusing to have sex with men. America is in fact being made great again. Damn. That's a lot of good fruits. <laughs> That's a lot of good fruits. <laughs> a lot of good fruits. A fruit buffet right there. Yeah. I mean, we're already seeing these two disastrous wars, both leaders on both sides, right? Putin and Zelensky and Netanyahu and Hamas are all saying, hey, we're, we're down for a peace treaty now. We're down to end this thing. Magically. Yeah, it's like, do you see the writing on the walls here? Do you yeah. see the way the powers are shifting? When Trump's in office, people get excited because number one, Trump's a businessman, right? He's He's the apprentice. You're fired. You know, he's, he's the guy who knows how to make the art of the deal, right? He wrote the book, The Art of the Deal. Trump knows how to make good business deals. So when Trump was in office, his, his style of leadership was to go around to the countries we need to make peace with or whatever and offer them a really sweet, good deal that works for both sides, right? Trump always made these deals that were like win-wins. It's the reason he got the Abraham Accords signed and things like that. He goes to someone and says, look, I know what you want. Here's what I want. Let's find a way where we both get what we want. And so countries are very excited when Trump's in office because they're like, business is a booming, baby. It's time for to make some deals. Like we're going to do what Trump loves to do. But what kind of deals do you think Obama was making or Bush or Biden? Like when those kinds of deep state actors are in office, they're not making sweet business deals with other countries. They're saying, hey, here's what's going to happen. We're going to come into your country. We're going to start this war and you're going to say nothing about it or we'll take everything from you. <laughs> you know, like it's threats. It's not business deals. So do you think other countries might be a little bit tired of that by now? Being bullied and pushed around by America all the time? Yemen and Syria and Libya and all these poor third world countries that we just walk all over them for profit and control them. And then Trump comes in and tries to liberate these countries from the tyranny. Like the whole world has shifted since 2016. Initially, the smearing worked really well, but there's a karmic law, right? There's actually a Bible verse that says, resist 
Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Have you heard that verse? Mm. I think it's a proverb, but I could be wrong. What, the, what that verse means is it's touching on a, a karmic law between the positive and negative polarities. That when the negative polarity tries to control you and therefore gain more negative power, that's how they do it. They have to deceive you, manipulate you, corrupt you, and things like that. And when you resist a negative entity, which resist in this case, it means more like not giving your power to them not resist in the spiritual sense of like fear and stuff, but like resist giving into what they want. You just say, no, thank you. No, I don't, I don't consent. I don't consent. I don't agree. I don't agree. When you resist evil, it must eventually flee from you. Why? Because as we've talked about on the show, the negative polarity needs your free will. They need you to give them your free will. And because the universe operates under the law of one, which is that all is one, the law of free will is the first law the creator established at the beginning of creation. And this is something the law of one teaches. They call it, um, Ra calls it the first primal distortion of the law of one is free will. Mm -hmm. Meaning that the creator wants every sentient being to have the free will to do what they want. And so although God's will is always good, absolutely, uh, the Bible also says God is light in whom there is no darkness at all, none. So God's will is only for the good of everyone. But in another sense, it is good for God to allow people to have their free will and even to commit evil acts and violate God's laws. Because in doing so, they incur the weight of the divine law against them. And they will surely suffer the same violation upon themselves. This is a karmic law. It's the perfect justice system that God's already established in our universe. So God is fine to allow people to act out their evil intentions because their own violations always come back around them. Mm. And so the negative polarity, being very wise and intelligent, knows this law. And we've, we've talked about this a lot, right, Jeremy, on our show. They always have to tell you what they're doing yeah. in little ways to alleviate the karmic burden they have to, to carry by violating people's free will. And so this is why they try to coax you into agreeing with them and brainwash you and control the way you think and censor information they don't want you to see to get your agreement. Come here, come this way, agree with me. They have to censor truth to get that to happen. And so the negative polarity is always trying to do this, right? Well, what is going to happen now if Trump goes on to have a really great another four years in office? This is the great fear, I think, that the negative polarity has and why we're at a very interesting time is because the negative polarity just flat out cannot allow Trump to have a successful four years as president because they've already turned this guy into a national hero, right, by, by trying to get rid of him so harshly. If you resist evil, it will flee from you because the more that the negative polarity tries to get your free will from you or control you and you don't allow them to, they get depolarized. They lose power and the pendulum of karma turns its momentum against them and starts to come towards them. And now they got to run the other direction. So that's why they flee from you when you don't give in to them because they incur the wrath of the law of karma against themselves because you cannot violate anyone in this universe under the law of one without being violated yourself. So the negative polarity has a very short period of time that they can get your agreement. Otherwise they gotta hightail it because the law works against them. So what do you think, Jeremy, the negative polarity is gonna do if Trump has an amazing four years as president and roots out corruption and reestablishes the people into power and gets rid of the IRS and all this amazing stuff he's promising? Dude, he would go down in history as the most beloved American president by far in history. Do you think that the negative polarity wants to allow that to happen? Because what that would mean, it would spell the end of the deep state, of all corruption in government. These people would never be able to re-salvage their reputation with the public, right? After 10 years of dragging America through fake Russian collusion, Russia, 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 BS, nonsense, all the other lies about Trump and smear campaigns and indictments and weaponizing the DOJ against him. 
calling him a Nazi, radicalizing leftists to trying to shoot and kill him. It's been insane what they've put the American people through just to demonize Trump. And you think they want to let him go down in history as the greatest American president ever? Because they're done if that happens. No one will ever watch mainstream media or listen to a politician again unless they're on the side of, of the new freedom movement. So I think what's probably going to happen, and here's the positive on this, is that now Trump's not trying to go it alone anymore, right? Definitely. That's the big positive. Definitely. He has learned from his 2016 uh, first term that he can't do this alone anymore. And so he's surrounded himself with this amazing Justice League or team of people that are very qualified to help him root out corruption in Washington. So he's showing the, the deep state, hey, I mean business and I'm coming for you. So now the prey has become the predator type of thing. And now they're, they're running with their tails between their legs going, oh, where do we hide? And I'm like, dude, if I was Anthony Fauci, can you imagine not leaving the country right now? Oh, <laughs> watching yeah, RFK. We'll probably, we'll probably see a case or two of that, of people fleeing. We have to. I mean, RFK literally wrote a book on Anthony Fauci, yeah. which he's never been sued for, which means it's all true. And he's got all the receipts on this guy committing literally the greatest crime against humanity in all of human history. If, if it ends up being true, that which we have a lot of evidence for that it's true at this point, that Anthony Fauci was the he was the ideator and the funder of the gain of function research with the Wuhan lab through the NIH. He was the guy behind it all, really, funding this gain of function on the coronavirus. And then, whoops, sneaks out of the Wuhan lab that he was funding. And whoops, the whole world gets sick. And whoops, Anthony Fauci makes $500 million. He's done, bro, if he goes to court for this. RFK will barbecue him in court. He has an entire book of receipts on this guy's corruption. And I think how many hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of people died in COVID? If you, and of course, it's not only Anthony Fauci's fault, but if you pin him as the ringleader of it all, where it was really yeah. kind of his idea and he funded this, and there's 300, 200 million deaths around the world, that's easily by far the greatest crime against humanity we've ever seen. So why, why would he even risk staying in the country at this point? The, Everything has flipped. Everything has changed from this one election. And we've felt this inversion of our reality. Yeah. And so it's going to be really cool to watch it play out because I have no idea how it's going to play out. I know how I hope it plays out. But at the end of the day, God's will is going to reign sovereign as it always does. And I will accept whatever happens. But yep. it does seem like the universe is moving some pieces into place to finally say yes to the collective consciousness of America for the last four years the majority of people in our country have been crying out saying, we don't agree with this. We don't like this. We don't want this. We don't agree with this kind of leadership. Help, help. And there's nothing we could do about it because they're in office and they're going to do what they're going to do. But I think all of that karma, good karma, we've accumulated by uniting. People are waking up. It, we're living through the great awakening right now has incurred positive karma for the, for the populace so that now the wheel of karma has flipped and is now in our favor and against them. And the reason it was against our favor and for their favor for the last four years is because there was karma built up there too, right? How long has the American people outsourced to politicians and mainstream media? For decades, right? We have incurred this karma on ourselves. It's nobody else's fault. We've allowed this corruption in Washington. We're the ones who've turned a blind eye to the corruption for so long until it festered to the point like a boil we couldn't afford to not look at it anymore, like a wound that's infected. At some point, you got to acknowledge that wound. And that's what we just did in the last four years where we said, okay, enough is enough. And I think we've seen the universe say, okay, you got it. Your will has been acknowledged. And we've seen this massive flip. So I think number one, we're going to watch the deep state potentially get even more desperate than ever and try more desperate psyops than ever, which will be a great positive, I think, because it'll wake more people up. Whatever they do at this point wakes people up. We know that. But here's the other benefit, dude, is because Trump is not doing this alone anymore, he's, I feel like he's kind of at a point where he's, he's weathered so much of their storm that he's kind of invincible at this point. And what I mean by that is, do you think the deep state wants to kill Trump now? Because I sure don't. 
Mm-hmm. I think they're looking at J.D. Vance as his VP and they're like, what's the point if we kill Trump and J.D. Vance steps in his place? We don't want that guy being the leader of this yep. country any more than Trump. Agreed. Uh, he's also surrounded by RFK, Elon Musk, Tucker Carlson, Vivek Ramaswamy, Tulsi Gabbard. We could go on and on about the people behind Trump. Very true. It's like, what are they going to do? Are they going to murder everybody? They're going to yeah. kill 20 people? They can't and they know it and Trump knows it. And I think if I was Trump, he was asked this on Rogan and I liked his answer. He, he talked about the power of positive thinking. And he was like, I just don't want to give my attention to like negative thoughts. It's not helpful. I try to keep my focus always positive, always positive. A good outcome is going to happen. And look what he's manifested because of that philosophy, right? I think Trump now he's like not even remotely afraid of being assassinated anymore because they had their last opportunity to take him out before he won and they failed. And now it's like, what are they going to do? Kill Trump and make him into even more of a martyr and a national hero than he already is? They want Trump to go down for the rest of history like JFK as the greatest president <laughs> ever. Yeah. They want to make a movement out of Trump. I don't think they do. Yeah. And I think Trump knows they don't want that. And for Trump, you can imagine his line of thinking. He's probably like, I'm 78. I've lived an incredibly epic lifetime. I've left my children and lineage hundreds of millions, billions of dollars. I'm a national hero. Kill me. Kill me. I dare you. You won't do it. I've got nothing to lose at this point. Make me into the greatest martyr in history. Do it. I dare you. And they won't. Because he's surrounded by a host of people who are united with him. So this is the power of unity over the negative polarity. You're seeing it right now. If we truly gain unity, true unity, it is incredibly powerful. Trucker convoy, right? We saw unity there with this massive movement in Canada that elicited great results. They got the the mandates to be shut down. This uh, this election, right? Great unity happened. A massive cultural shift away from the radical left. Anytime humans come together and say, I got your back, you got my back, it's big trouble for the deep state. They can only thrive on a divided population. And that's why they try to keep the economy always suffering so that people are poor and destitute and having to live through challenges. So they they don't have the luxury of uniting with people when they're poor and and scared of what's going to happen tomorrow. So in every way, the instability we've seen in our country is absolutely intentional. Just as this attempt for unity and healing in our country is also intentional And I'm here for it, man. I I really don't care how it comes anymore. I don't care what catalyst the universe universe needs or uses to spark unity. I just care that unity is the outcome because we've been so divided. We've been at war with ourselves and the rest of the world for decades. Like what, what worse thing could happen at this point? We're so far beyond the pale. We have been at least that I'll take unity at any cost at this point. And thankfully, we got it at a very good cost. It could have been worse, but I agree with people. Donald Trump's not the ideal candidate. He's not the perfect candidate, but he is the candidate that the will of God chose to move our country forward into this period of hopefully healing. And so how can you not say yes to that? Bars. (laughs) I want to show people the, uh, because I know we'll get comments about it if we don't play it. the clips I was going to play about Jerome Powell. Yes. And then we'll kind of move past this. We should have played it earlier, but you were flowing, riffing, ranting. All right. So I'm going to play two of them <clears throat> just apart. So you guys can see what we're talking about on this one. Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, some of the president's elect's advisors have suggested that you should resign. Um, if he asked you to leave, would you go? No. <laughs> um, is, is, do you think that legally he did, you're not required to leave? No. Tell me you don't see his inner five-year-old like, no. You mad, bro? No. no. <laughs> I'm about to play the full clip in a moment. It's from just a few hours ago where the head of the Federal Reserve at a press conference was asked, if Trump tells you to step down, will you? And he says, no. And people are blown away saying, wait a minute, the president can't remove somebody? And that's actually the truth. The president cannot remove the head of the private Federal Reserve set up in 1913 that Ron Paul and countless others 
have been. Oh, shit. Ron Paul. Oh, Ron Paul also is joining Trump right now. Now I got to play this clip. Watch this, bro. This is next level. Uh, Dr. Paul and I noticed that uh, Fed uh, Chair Powell was asked, uh, you know, if President Trump asks you to resign, will you? And he flat out says, no, I will not. Uh, The law says that uh, the president can't fire me. And right away, my mind says, law says, well, there's a higher law, the supreme law of the land, that everybody raises their right hand, they swear an oath to, it's called the U.S. Constitution, and that law never gave any any, uh, authority to the federal government to create a monopoly central bank that can manipulate interest rates and uh, and counterfeit money. Counterfeiting is a crime. So the the government created this uh, bank that counterfeits. That's the law. That's the Fed should not exist according to the law. But pal, you know, he didn't mention any of this. Uh, so and and of all monopolies to give, you know, this isn't a monopoly to create milkshakes for 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 people. This is money. This is a a a part of every single transaction in our nation that they gave them a monopoly. Uh, it's it's astounding. So he's saying, no, the president, because of the law, can't fire me. You know, that's not even the issue here. The issue is the existence of the Federal Reserve. And, that, you know, mm-hmm. while that may not be addressed today, it will be someday. And uh, we say the sooner the better. Is that right, Dr. Paul? <laughs> Crazy, right? Nice. And then Amazing, Ron Paul gives dude. his thoughts. But fourth turning, man, the awakening is here. I sure never thought I'd hear people talking this openly about the fact that the Federal Reserve isn't a governmental agency. Actually, we didn't play the full clip with Jerome, but he goes on to explain his answer there. And he basically just comes right out with it. He's like, Federal Reserve is a private corporation, not under the jurisdiction of the government. So he doesn't have the authority to depose me. Yeah, I can play that. Oh, my God. He just said it in an interview. (laughs) The dirty secret, the quiet part. You want me to play that part? Yeah, if you got it, let's play it. Yeah. It's just, it was a 12 minute clip, so let me find it. Maybe it's Hi, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, some of the president's elect's advisors have suggested. Oh yeah, this is the, this is the full clip. What should be the proper relationship between a chairman? Oh, this part was kind of crazy. What is the uh, proper relationship? What should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and that means basically that uh, there is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. This is Alan Greenspan, X. Yeah, that's right. This is crazy that he's saying that. As long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. And uh, I've had uh, very good relationships <laughs> with presidents. That's wild. And, uh, it's so good. Give us quality. What I'm looking for is repeat cut. Yeah, I, I don't know. I guess he doesn't play it in that clip. But you basically summarized it. He was. He basically says he doesn't have the power to do that. Yeah. Right. Yep, because we're a private corporation. But he doesn't, I mean, Powell doesn't say that up there. Yeah, I don't know if he says those exact words. I can't remember his exact words, but he broke it down for the reporter at some point. You guys will have to watch that if you can find the full one. All of, all of these things we're talking about, to me, all I see in it is just collective shadow work. Yeah. And we're just bringing up the shadows. RFK being put as the head of the... Uh, Committee on Presidential Assassinations, getting to go study the CIA, audit them, monitor them. That's shadow work for our country. Mm-hmm. To reconcile the deep you know, pain points of our past, our racial past, segregated past, our military past, economic past. There's so much corruption that's happened in this country that we have yet to address. And so when you see anybody, whether it's Trump or not, trying to clean up these corrupt systems and make them work for the people in a way that's actually beneficial, you should see that as a kind of shadow work for the country, that the country is really just like a macrocosm of every individual, right? The microcosm. 
it works in the same way. We as a nation have to heal exactly the way an individual has to heal, which is to boldly look at those things that are uncomfortable to acknowledge and say, I forgive you, I see you, I accept you, and you're no longer my enemy. And now I can bring change and healing to that area. America is beginning to do this now, right, under this new administration, hopefully. It sure seems like we're about to do it with all the videos Trump's team is dropping and all the reforms they're suggesting. But man, we're just in for an incredible four-year time period. No matter what happens, we know it's going to be interesting and there's going to be a lot of progress made. Whether it comes through pain or through joy, we're about to find out. But we know we're going to see some serious progress because the the eggs have hatched, the, the cat's out of the bag, all the secrets are being told now. We're seeing the things like the Federal Reserve as a private corporation openly being discussed, abolishing the IRS openly being discussed. So many crazy things that probably most of us didn't think we would see discussed in our lifetime are being talked about on the airwaves of the internet right now, which just goes to show you that evolution can happen so much faster than you think it's, it's almost impossible to really nail down the time period you're living in and understand it until way later when you look back and say, oh, I was living through those times. Wow. It's easy to miss the forest for the trees. But every so often something so remarkable happens that you get to see that you're in the forest and you know you get to recognize the big picture of where you are. All right. So I feel like we've covered a good amount of ground today. Uh, me and Aaron wanted to just pull one question because we feel like it really highlights the kind of the central theme of today's episode, which is all about unity and navigating uh, the new, you know, the changes and not participating or adding to the polarity or adding to the duality. So we have a question that will show up on screen from Jim's Crop Circle. <laughs> Love the name. <laughs> nice. He says, I feel like we're headed into the highest possible timeline. I also feel the weight has lifted a bit. My question is this, how do we show compassion to those family and friends that are close to us, but are going through their own dark night of the soul? How do we have healthy conversations when they get angry? I want to reassure them, but also feeling like it's just not possible. What are your thoughts, Aaron? This is more in your wheelhouse. Yeah, this is such a great question and uh, probably super relevant to all of our listeners and central to what it means to be an awakened being, right? It means to always come from love and understanding and to take radical self-responsibility, especially for your own triggers. You know, this is one thing we've seen very pervasive in culture is this um, self-righteousness that whatever I'm angry at is true and I'm right to be angry about it and all of that. And I'm going to take out my anger on other people it's so irresponsible to, to behave that way. Your triggers are your problem, not somebody else's. So if you're upset at somebody else's beliefs, that's not their problem, that's your problem. You have the imbalance that needs to be healed. And so true awakening means taking self-responsibility. So I'm not upset. In fact, I love this. Um, there's a lesson from A Course in Miracles that says, I'm never upset for the reason I think. It's one of the daily lessons. Mm. It's such a great quote because it's so true, man. When somebody else's opinion upsets us, we think we're angry because they're wrong and they're believing in bad things that are harmful for other people. And I believe in good things that are good for people and they should believe like me so the world could be a better place. That's what people think. And in actuality, you are identified with your opinions and your egoic self-image of I'm always right is being assaulted by this person's opinions is feeling threatened by this person's opinions. And so really your attacks are not because you just care about the good of all, that's all. No, you're attacking them because you wanna prove that you're superior to them, that you're right and they're wrong. It's an ego battle, there's nothing virtuous about it. So that we're never upset for the reason we think means exactly that. There's a deeper subconscious motive when I'm triggered. And it's again, it's okay to be triggered. We're not demonizing that. Or I'm not trying to make it sound like you're, you're not spiritual if you get triggered. We all get triggered. What is your response to your triggers is what matters. What is your response to your anger is what shows how awakened you are. So if your family, relatives, friends trigger you, please do not take that out on them. Do not do what everyone else does and try to argue them out of their positions. It doesn't work and it never will work. Instead, just try to radically understand their perspective. 
And this is a practice I teach called spiritual balancing. Spiritual balancing means I should never, there should not be one perspective in the entire multiverse that bothers me, that makes me angry and triggers me to lose my inner peace. Not even Hitler's philosophy should trigger me, right? I can, I'm fully allowed to disagree with it and all of those important things, but it's the emotional reaction we're discussing here. If something causes you to lose your peace, that's an imbalance. And so the way we balance these things is we actually need to consider the perspective we find triggering, meaning I'm really entrenched in this position and really in resistance to that position. So there's a polarity, there's a moving away, there's a pushing off, and that's called polarizing, right? To, to become positively polarized, which is a term you guys have heard me use, literally means to move away from that which is negative. That's the definition. To polarize to the negative literally means to move away from that which is positive. So when you move away from a polarity, you are polarizing. So we've become polarized because both sides are increasingly convinced I'm on the good side, they're on the bad side. Me good, you bad. Now I'm justified to hate you, revile you, condemn you, and judge you. And so they may do this to you, right? Your family and friends may do this to you, saying, how could you support a xenophobic racist, blah, blah, blah. And of course, they, they don't have the nuance yet to understand that, of course, you don't think you're supporting a person like that. You disagree with their opinions. If they're at that place where they don't see that, then you're better off to not try to make them see it. You just are. You're not going to win a battle of the egos. You're just going to entrench them further in their ego. And so instead, I've found it works much better to do what Jesus said to do, which is agree with your adversary quickly. And then he says, and by doing so, when you, when you overcome good, when you overcome evil with good, you heap burning coals on their head. Meaning it's a, there's a depolarization effect that takes place. When someone comes at you with anger and, oh, how could you believe this? Oh, and instead you go, oh, I understand why you feel that way. I, I, accept the, I accept your opinion. It's okay. I don't, I don't hate you for believing that at all. All of a sudden it's, it's very diffusing to the other person. So for me, I want to make sure the other person knows that I understand their perspective. Long before I attempt to persuade them to see something new, first, there's no opening for them to see something differently if they don't feel you accept their current position. And accept doesn't mean agree, it means you understand. And that's the main difference I think I would give to uh, Jim's crop circle in answer to your question, is that there's a massive difference between agreeing with somebody and understanding them. Yeah. Understanding someone is an act of love. And if someone doesn't feel that you love or care for them, they're not open to what you're selling, period. They've got to feel that you actually care and accept them where they are. And then you'll be surprised how open-minded that people become. But the problem is nobody really tries to do that in our culture, right? It's just a mud-slinging food fight fest on the internet. Everywhere you look, people just want to be right and argue their opinions. So it's like I'm much more interested in helping someone feel understood than I am in feeling right. And when you meet people where they are, you find that people are able to meet you where you are. There's a re reciprocal effect that happens. But if you can't give what you want to receive, like if you want them to understand you, well then, dude, you got to give them that first. You got to understand them and let them know you understand them. So really what I find, Jeremy, most people are looking for that are so charged up on any political ideology, left or right or in between, is it's like people just want to feel understood. 100%. Even if you don't agree, you can say, you know, I understand why you would think that. I don't really agree with some of those things and I have some other takes, but like, I do understand why you would come to that conclusion. It's amazing what that can do for somebody just to open them up, open their mind and heart to have a real conversation. Um, there's no real conversation taking place when two people are throwing their evidence at each other for why I'm right and you're wrong. And no, but this, but Trump said that, but the news said this. And I, I think that you think this, nobody wins. It's a, it's a food fight. Everybody gets dirty but nobody actually comes out the victor. So that's my, my short answer is help people feel understood. Be way more interested in helping your family and friends who differ from you feel understood and not rejected. And really, if you've done that, you've done all you need to do. 
Um, you don't even need to have a conversation with them. It's enough to just let people feel understood. But I found that usually it does open up avenues for healthy conversations to take place. Hmm. That's a beautiful answer to uh, end us off. Hope that helps, Jim. I'm not going to top what Aaron just said. So we're going to let the we're going to let the master's words. Uh... Hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> Ripple. Much appreciation for the question, Jim. Yeah. So today's episode, guys, was, man, it's been a, it was Woo. a long time coming. We hope you guys appreciated it. And um, let us know what themes you most appreciate from, from today's conversation below in the comments. We kind of touched on a lot, the economic side, the spiritual side, the political side, the socio-cultural side, and everything in between. So... On that note, we will uh, pick back up in, in another two weeks. Um, this episode was uh, hopefully a unifying message and something that everyone can you know find something to agree on. As always, make sure you guys are subscribed to us on Rumble. Hopefully Google <laughs> hopefully Google and YouTube leaves this episode up. It's uh, yeah, we'll we've see. had a little bit of a little bit of struggle with that, but. Um, we love making these for you guys. We want to continue doing so. So whatever that looks like, uh, we will be doing so. So we wish you all peace and love. Hope you have a beautiful week and we'll see you in the next episode.